guess we'll get started. Um, I was going to make a joke, but I, I think um, it's maybe a little too late for that. So, um, um, Robert's rules of order, the basic rules of order for this meeting, except where Vermont law takes precedence. You cannot change Vermont state law, but you can change Robert's rules of order with a two-thirds vote if you choose. An article must be moved and seconded by the body, then restated by the moderator before it's under consideration and debate on the article may begin. After I restate the motion, the person who made the motion has the right to speak first in the debate. Articles may have only one amendment at a time associated with them, and amendments to an article likewise may only have one amendment at a time associated with them. After you've spoken once on a particular article, you will not be recognized a second time during discussion on that article or amendment until all other voters who wish to speak on the issue for the first time are given an opportunity to do so. Division of the House can be requested by one voter before or after a voice vote. Vermont state law provides for a paper ballot vote on the request of seven voters unless the town has made other arrangements. Again, before or after a voice vote or after a division of the House. This means that the moderator could ask for a voice vote and declare the motion passed. Someone could immediately request division of the House. The moderator then must require a vote by show of hands or rising and the moderator would declare the motion passed. Someone could immediately request a paper ballot and the moderator would then have to honor this request if the number of people asking for the paper ballot meets minimum requirements. Debate may be cut off by a motion to call the question and a two-thirds vote to do so. All motions, remarks, and discussion must be addressed to the moderator. You must confine your remarks to the merits of the question. I'll do my best to recognize you in the order that you've raised your hands. You must be recognized to speak, even to call the question. After being recognized, please stand up, wait for a microphone, then give your name and speak in a loud voice so that your comments may be heard by everyone. Your speeches must be confined to the merits of the question. You will not be allowed to engage in personal attacks on a member of the, of the body or their motives. Vermont state law prohibits consideration of articles that have not been warned. This means you cannot take binding action under the article other business and you can't amend warned articles such that they will deal with business that hasn't been warned. Reconsideration of an article is allowed by Vermont state law until the point is reached where another article is under consideration. This means that if you voted down an article, a motion can be made to reopen consideration of this article by a person on the prevailing side. And yes, I need to ask. However, once the next article is on the floor, no more action can be taken regarding the previous article at this meeting. My role as moderator is to help you accomplish the business you intend to do. Please raise your hand and ask questions if you don't understand what's happening or if you think what is happening is wrong for some reason or if you want to do something but you don't know how to proceed. Please tell me if you think I'm ruling improperly. You have the right to challenge the moderator's rulings. Only registered voters of the town may vote at annual or special meetings of the town. I ask at this time those who are not registered voters in the town of Wyndham, please raise your hand. Not. Yep. Okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, you may not vote, and unless there's a suspension of the rules, you may not speak on articles. Okay. So now I'd like to read the uh, invocation to the town meeting. We're gathered today in civil assembly. We gather as a community in the oldest sense of the word. We gather to come together and try to make decisions about what is right, about what is wrong. Let us advocate for our positions, but not at the expense of others. Let us remember there's an immense gap between saying I am right and saying I believe I am right. And our neighbors with whom we disagree are good people with hopes and dreams as true and as high as ours. And let us remember that in the end, caring for each other in this community is of far greater importance than any difference we may have. At this point, I call the meeting to order. 
it's 10.54 by my clock, and I ask that we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so it sounds like we have a microphone upstairs. Can people downstairs still hear me? Okay, we can hear you loud and clear, so please don't speak until you're called upon. I can also see everybody down there, or at least I can see five people. Um, my name is Michael McLean, um, and we'll start by electing a town, oh, and I'd like to introduce the select board and the select board clerk. So, uh, Cord Scott, Michael Pelton, George Dutton, Mary McCoy. Um, so, we'll start with Article 1, to elect a town moderator for the year ensuing. I nominate Mike McLean. Okay, there's a nomination for Mike McLean. It's been seconded, and nominations don't need a second, but I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> is that a third, Carol? Thank you. Um, uh, any other nominations for moderator? Seeing no other nominations for moderator, um, I guess that's uh, uh, one nomination for Michael McLean to elect a mo town moderator for a year ensuing. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Okay, so thank you. Article one, Michael McLean's town moderator. Article two, uh, one second, Russ. Um, before we get started in Article Two, I, I, if there's no objection from the body, our state representative and our state treasurer are here, and I know Heather Chase would like to say a few words. If there's no objections, before we get going, and then Heather Heather can be done uh, when she's done with her comments. So, see, Heather's going to come up here to the dais. Yep. Thank you very much for allowing me to say a few words. I want you all to know I have a 20 minute presentation here, but I'm gonna cut it down to about two minutes because we're running so late. But don't think I didn't come prepared. Um, things that are going on, I think you know that I'm your state rep and that I'm on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee at the State House. A lot has been going on at the State House. Um, school funding is a huge issue that we're trying to tackle. Um, a third of the towns that have already voted, voted down their um, school budgets. So it's really giving um, us the message that we need to make it more transparent, fairer, and take a look at it. So I feel that that is um, happening, and I'm not going to say a lot more about that. Um, I've been visiting um, Wyndham every, periodically, and people are coming to the constituent forums. Really appreciate that. I have a newsletter for you all, um, and I didn't have enough for everyone, so I'm going to have Ellen send it out electronically, and I'll have hard copies in the town hall. Um, one thing that I think um, we're working on, I'm just going to take a brief moment in our committee, we're working on H-121, which is a data privacy law. It's super important. It's doing everything to protect our privacy from social security to our irises to our vein patterning. Pa patterning. Um, all of this is really important because um, for AI, it's going to be the foundation for laws to come to control AI. So I'm really excited. Um, our committee has worked really hard on that. Um, one fun thing that I just have to say, our esteemed treasure, I'm going to sit down in a second, but our esteemed treasure helped us get the Irish trade bill advanced and is um, going to help us work on that and, and have it in his department. And I'm really appreciative of that. And I'm appreciative when you guys all get in touch with me. I love receiving your emails, seeing you at the State House. And I'm really happy to be here to see all of you here waiting. It's a real um, testament to our democracy. 
Um, I really appreciate the moderator's um, comments on our neighbors and, and we can see things very differently and yet still care for one another. And in that spirit, I appreciate so much um, representing you and please feel free to get a hold of me. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Chase. Um, uh, Mr. Pichek, would you like to speak? If there's no objection from the House, State Treasurer Mike Pichek would like to have the floor. Well, it's a pleasure to be back uh, in Wyndham. It was a pleasure to be here with you at your uh, last town meeting in May. And um, I think I mentioned at that town meeting when I ran for State Treasurer, I had the opportunity to visit every town in Vermont. And I really thought that was a an extraordinarily valuable experience to hear what was on everyone's mind, to stay connected to the community, to learn even more about the state that I grew up in, uh, but hadn't necessarily seen and visited and heard from everyone. So I've tried to continue to do that uh, through my time in office as well, and look forward to spending the morning with you and lunch as well, and hearing what's on your mind and uh, hearing what concerns you have and what we can be doing in Montpelier to address those concerns uh, more directly. But, you know, the focus of our office, what we've really been trying to focus on are issues around housing. Uh, we supported housing through um, a low interest loan program that we announced. I think I probably talked a little bit about that in May, uh, but now we have $55.5 million out in low interest loans throughout the state, supporting all types of housing, including senior housing, which I think is going to be critical uh, to the future of Vermont that our seniors have safe places to live here in Vermont, that they have places to go to free up their homes for other young families so that we can grow our communities, grow our tax base, grow our revenues, uh, and support all the things that we need to support. So that's gonna continue to be a focus of ours in our office uh, in the years to come. I think it's one of our long-term challenges in Vermont, as well as climate resiliency, which in Southern Vermont is a big deal. We need to make sure our communities are safe from the changing uh, weather and changing climates that we're experiencing. So thank you so much. I think when I visited last time, we cleaned out all the unclaimed property in Wyndham, Vermont. But in case you have any that still remains, I'll also encourage you to visit our website, missingmoney.com. Uh, people uh, never know uh, how much money they might have there. I was just at the Putney town meeting on Tuesday, and I was visiting with my dad. I grew up in Brattleboro and said, hey, dad, do you know this person? He has $38,000 of unclaimed property. And he said, oh yeah, I know that person. I've been doing his tax return for 40 years. So I was able to connect with him before the meeting and get him a check uh, in the coming weeks. So do check missingmoney.com. And again, thank you so much for having me. Have a good meeting. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Okay, um, Russ, do I see your hand in the back? I'm not sure why there was feedback there. Um, okay, so um, Russ, if I understand you, you had a motion that you want to change the order of the business of the meeting? That, that is correct. Okay. Uh, do you, was there anything in particular you wanted to have next in the business? Well, I, w I wanted to move the school. Uh, items forward on the agenda so that the next items to be considered at the town meeting. Okay, there's, so there's a, there's a motion to suspend the rules of the meeting and that motion requires a two-thirds majority vote. The motion is to move the order of the business and uh, do I have a second on that motion? Okay, I see a second, Bill Casey. All right, so that's not debatable, my understanding, to move the orders. Uh, to suspend the rules to move the order of the business. So this is going to be a straight vote, a two-thirds majority vote required to change the order of the business and go into the school meeting. Does that make sense, Allison? Can I ask a question? Uh, you can ask the moderator a question, yeah. Okay. So before we come into the school stuff, we adjourn the town meeting and then we adjourn after the school Is that what we're talking about? The voters we can't want to hear do. you. We can't hear Allison. Okay, so Allison asked if the the what the motion is to do is to move directly, adjourn the town meeting, and go into the school meeting. Okay, so this is this is the motion 
to suspend the rules and go into school meeting. Does everybody understand what we're going to be voting on? Okay. All right. So this is going to be, we're going to, I'm going to ask for a show of hands for suspending the rules. Okay. So all those in favor of suspending the rules and moving into school business, please raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, please put your hands down. Um, any opposed to this motion? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion carries, and we're suspending the rules and moving directly into school business. So, okay. Yep. All right. So, if everybody turns to page eight, and I, I'm sorry I didn't mention if if people don't have their annual reports. There are some in the back of the room, so uh, you can get those. Hang on, Mike. We can't hear you now. Okay. Can you hear me now downstairs? No. Okay. So we're moving into school business. Johnny, the people downstairs say they can't hear me. Okay. Okay, so we're moving into, into school business, which is on page eight. All right, so article one. Okay, so, so while they're working out the audio downstairs, the select board is now going to change seats with the school board. So uh, school board members, you're asked to come up to the, to the front of the room. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me? Okay. Introduce you to the school board, Rory Rosselot, Abigail Pelton, Dan Roth. Okay, thank you for being up here. Uh, so article one of the school meeting, to elect a moderator for a term of one year. Looking for a motion from the floor. Carolyn? Okay, there's a nomination for Michael McLean. Are there any other nominations for school moderator? Okay, seeing no other nominations. Uh, the vote will be for a moderator for the school for one year. All those in favor for Michael McLean say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, Article 2. To elect all other officers required by law to be elected at the Wyndham School. And there's two positions. Is that right? Two positions? Okay. Um, so... Or is there three positions? There's three positions. Okay. So, um, first position is for school treasurer. Looking for nominations from the floor. Carolyn. Okay. There's a nomination for Kathy Scott for school treasurer. Are there any other nominations? Okay. Seeing no other nominations, uh, the vote is going to be for Kathy Scott for one year as school treasurer. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Kathy, thank you. School treasurer. And the next position is for um, three-year three -year term. And there, there's a typographical error that should say ending 2027 there. So that's for this term, for the, the full three-year term. And uh, is that whose position is that? 
That'd be mine. That's Dan's? Okay. Yep. All right. So this is for uh, uh, Dan Roth's position. Looking for nominations from the floor. Russ. Okay, there's a nomination for Nancy Tips. Any other nominations? Antia? Okay, there's a nomination for Daniel Roth. Are there any other nominations? Okay, seeing no, see no other nominations, uh, we're gonna do a vote by hand. Nancy? I'm sorry? Oh, you'd like to speak? Yeah, so I, I'd like to give um, the candidates a chance to speak. So um, whoever would like, Dan, since you're the incumbent, do you want to go first? And uh, Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, two minutes. Cool. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you know me, but... Yeah, you speak. Can you see if the mic... Yeah. Just show come on. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm Daniel Roth. I uh, moved here about two and a half years ago. Um, joined the school board uh, what, in June, I believe, and uh, I was appointed. Um, I, you know, I, I took over a seat, and I, uh, you know, what I wrote in my letter when I you know, sent it to Abby and to Rory is that I have a two-year-old daughter, and I would, would like to see the town flourish, the community flourish, and uh, I come from a background of mathematics, uh, statistics, accounting, so it seemed like a natural fit for me to uh, join the board and help out with budgets and uh, other places that perhaps you know they could use me. So, uh, but you know, it, throughout my time here, I've I've loved it, and we we love this town, and you know we're going to be here for a while. So, yeah, and I'm an open book. So you know, feel free to ask me any questions. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Nancy. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Huh? All right. Um, what I would like to do, first of all, is a poem that I've written for you, which I feel um, captures the essence of the situation, at least as I see it. Wyndham is in some distress. Some might even say, a heck of a mess. For our kids, we all want what's best, but we all want our taxes to be a whole lot less. <laughs> but wait, we have another problem. The Wyndham School Board meetings are not any fun. They're not any fun for anyone. And if you're looking for a laugh, they're not the place to come. And that's why nobody wants to run for school board. Will you run for school board? You can ask them, but you'll be met by bitter laughter. <laughs> so that's why I'm running, so you don't have to. Vote for me, and we'll all live happily ever after. So now, assuming that I still have a little bit of time left, right? Um, I just want to tell you about what I feel are my qualifications. I have a master's degree in elementary education, and I taught first grade. Uh, more recently, I worked for nine years in an office where our job was to try to stop young children from being poisoned by lead in the environment. <clears throat> Childhood lead poisoning is an extremely controversial topic. And my job was to listen to very passionately held, very conflicting points of view and write strategy that we could all agree on so that we could move forward to the next crisis. And I feel like this is a lot of what the school board either does or should do. And I feel that I have the skills to offer Thank you, that. Nancy. Well, I do have the skills, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dan and Nancy. Uh, so now we're going to vote for, uh, for the school board member. So. Um, Let's start. Carolyn? If seven voters request it, we can certainly entertain that. So are you making a motion for a paper ballot? Okay, there's a motion for a paper ballot. Are there six other voters that want a paper ballot? Okay, there, that certainly meets the requirement. So 
Um, Ellen, are we ready for doing a paper ballot? Okay. So for can you, for. Can you explain to us how we do it down here? Yep, that's what I was about to do. So, um, so for for people who haven't been through this, uh, what this means is that every voter is going to come through a check-in and a check-out process with the Board of Civil Authority and the town clerk, and you're going to cast a paper ballot, and the paper ballots will be counted. So you'll be given a piece of paper. Ellen, do you have the piece of paper that the voters will be given? Okay, you'll be given a colored index card, and you'll write the candidate that you want. And again, the two candidates are Dan Roth, Nancy Tips. So you can write Dan and Nancy, Roth, Tips, or any combination. So um, I think they'll understand. So um, just please put the name on the index card, go through the check-in process, and, uh, and then you'll check out. And then when everybody has had a chance to vote, then the votes will be counted, and we will tell everybody who was elected. So, Ellen, do you have the... Uh, this is Article 2. Yep. Yes, sir. That's correct, yeah. So after people have voted upstairs, we're going to need uh, at least six people uh, to step outside so, because we have a maximum capacity from the fire marshal of 150. Okay, so... We have um, 12 people down, 12 voters downstairs, Mike. Okay, so um, everybody understands we need to just swap out who's going to be upstairs and downstairs at the same time. I'm sorry? No, there, were, there was only a handful. Yep. Yes? Yeah, that, somebody had made that recommendation, so I think that, that makes sense rather than have everybody stand up en masse. So um, we'll start with, with over here to my left, Rachel and Jack. So we'll start with that, and then Ellen, you're all set for checking people in and checking people out? Okay, and I'd ask everybody to keep the din down while we're doing this. Thank you very much. Um, while the BCA is counting and going through the ballots, uh, if there's no objection, objection, Bill Dunkel would like to have the floor for a few minutes. Bill. Thanks, folks. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bill Dunkel. I'm the town energy coordinator, among other things. And I just wanted to say a quick word about storm window inserts. Uh, as you look around the room, uh, we, there are storm window inserts that were built specifically for this room last fall. Uh, and this is a, a program called the Window Dressers. Window Dressers is a, a nonprofit organization that's based in Maine. They've been in, uh, in existence for about a decade. And they now have expanded their operation to Vermont. So we can build uh, inexpensive, highly energy efficient storm window inserts for private homes. Uh, they sell for a normal window for about $50. Uh, and they're very easy to uh, put in. You insert them from the inside of your house. There's a little pull tab at the end of the uh, winter. You just pop the window back out and set it aside. And th those windows, if you take care of them, should last about 10 years. So if you have drafty windows in your house, you're looking for a relatively inexpensive but highly efficient way to cut down on your heating bill. See me or other members of the Energy Committee, and we'll come over and measure the windows in your house, and we'll build you some window inserts next November. I've left a whole bunch of brochures on back table here, downstairs, and I've got some. Uh, you can see me if you want one. But um, Antia Rupert uh, will be glad to talk to you about the windows we built for her. Walt Woodruff uh, and Mary built them for her house a number of people. We've built hundreds of these things over the last three years, and we'll have another build in November. So, uh, and the, the partridges, too. I know we built uh, windows for you folks. So if you're interested and you think this might help you out in terms of lowering your, uh, your heating bills and your carbon footprint, come and see me or pick up a brochure. Thanks for your attention.
Okay, it looks like we have results for the election. So the good news is we don't have to do this again. Um, 145 ballots were cast. Four were spoiled. Uh, Dan Roth had 73 votes. Nancy Tips had 67. Dan Roth is the uh, elected school board member. Okay, we're gonna move back into the regular business. Um, Russ, did you have something you wanted to say? Okay, so sounds like you're, you're making a motion to suspend the rules of the meeting, change the order of the business, um, and you wanna move Article 6 ahead of Article 3. Um, just as a point of order, we're still in Article 2. So we still have one more, one more vote. So I will entertain that motion after we elect the final officer of Article 2, okay? All right, so we're still in Article 2, and we're gonna vote for the third uh, school director for the, the school district, the Wyndham Regional Education District. Uh, this is Crystal Corvu's uh, position, and uh, I'd just like to say thank you, Crystal, for, uh, for taking that position and, and doing your work on that. Thank you. Um, so looking for nominations from the floor. Right. Okay, there is a nomination for Paul Stapleton for this position. Looking for any other nominations from the floor? Yes. I'm sorry? Rory, okay. There's a, there's a nomination for Rory, okay. Uh, so that was Ann, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Ann Amston. Amston? Okay, any other nominations from the floor for this position? Yes, Cindy has a question. Uh, can, uh, Bill, can you bring the microphone so people downstairs can hear? It's just brief. If Rory is already on the Wyndham School Board, can she also be on that, what we're talking about right now, board? Don't know the answer to that question. Does anybody know the answer to that question? No. Sorry, can't answer that question. All right, any other nominations from the floor? All right, well, um, I'm gonna do a show of hands for um, the, the two officers. And so, yes. Yes, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, you, have, you can have the floor for two minutes. Yep, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to just say a couple words because I don't know a lot of people here. I've been in Wyndham for almost six years. I moved here in June of 2018 after I retired from a job in Connecticut where I worked in the public schools for 31 years as a school social worker, mostly at the high school level. And uh, when I saw this position was vacant, I thought it would be a good fit for me to uh, be a liaison with the the regional school board regarding Leland Gray. So that's why I'm offering to, to take the position. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you, Paul. Rory, would you like to speak? <laughs> no, nothing to say. Okay, so uh, we're gonna vote. And since Paul was nominated first, by a show of hands, all those in favor of Paul, please raise your hand. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. I think I, I can see the preponderance of hands. Um, all those in favor of Rory for this position, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, looks like um, Paul 
is the, vic the <laughs> candidate who wins the most votes. And yep, Paul Stapleton, thank you, you've been elected. Okay, so now I'll entertain Russ's motion to move, change the order of business. Um, so there's a motion on the floor uh, for people downstairs and upstairs uh, to change the order of the business so that we now go into Article 6 in the school board meeting. So this, we're going to vote now on whether or not to change the order of business. Does that make sense? Okay. Dan. Yeah, you know, I'm not clear what the rules on this, but uh, yeah, I'd just like to state I oppose. Um, we have a lot of information to get through. Right. Uh, and I think it's premature to jump to Article 6 at Understood, this time. But there's a motion on the floor right now, and the motion's not debatable by my readings of Robert's rule. So. Understood. So it's, it's, it's going to be a two-thirds majority vote whether or not to change the order of business. Okay? To go to Article 6. All right, that's what we're voting on now. Does that make sense? Everybody understands what we're voting on? Okay. All right, so all those in favor... And that, I'm sorry, that motion needs to be seconded. So I need a second. Bill Casey, second. All right. All those in favor of changing the order of business for Article 6, please raise your hand. I'm going to have to count hands here. Can I get a count for downstairs, please? Are there any hands downstairs? Can somebody unmute downstairs? The Zoom meeting is muted. Could you tell them we have nine votes they're running up there? Nine votes, okay. I had the television on mute. That's my mistake. Okay. Nine votes, okay. All right. All those opposed to changing the order of business, please raise your hand. So I'm counting 75 to, to 54. That's what I'm counting. We have, we have four votes down here, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. 75 to 58. There's nobody behind me. I, I, well, he, I counted him. Yep. OK, so by my ruling, that, that motion carries. So we're going to now change the order of the business to go into Article 6. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. That, the motion fails. The motion does not, does not carry. It's not a two-thirds majority, so we're going to continue with the order of the business. Thank you for correcting me. Okay. All right, so we're going to go into Article 3. Article 3, to compensate the school directors, $750 each is included in the proposed school budget for 2024-2025. Okay, looking for a motion from the floor, Allison. All right, there's a motion for it to be so moved. Antia, it's been seconded by Antia. Okay, Article 3, to compensate the school directors, $750 each is included in the proposed school budget for 2024 to 2025. Any discussion? Um, having been on the school board, I would like people to at least consider and think that um, the amount of work that goes in for this position and, and everyone has families and has, um, sorry, wasn't close enough, uh, other things that are going on. So it's very uh, challenging to juggle. And just so that folks know, um, $750 after taxes is around $400 that people will get paid 
um, to do this. So uh, going forward in the plan of however things move forward, uh, people should be considering kind of what those roles look like and how that recruitment will take place. It's gonna be hard to find people. I mean, none of us are in it for the money, um, <laughs> but it's just something I think people really should consider um, down the road if the candidates to um, want to be a part of the board might need some more motivation than, than the $400 a year. So just something to think about. So thank you. Okay. Just, uh, just to piggyback on that, uh, you know, I think, to, to put it lightly, it is a great value to the public <laughs> that the amount of effort that goes into the school board, how many meetings we've had, um, you know, that the average is uh, definitely not one, right, per month. You know, we, we've had, you know, I think in December, six different meetings, right? Each of those requires prep and agenda. The meeting itself, which can often last uh, you know, multiple hours, so, so yeah. Yeah, I definitely second what she's saying there. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Howie. Can I move to the floor to increase this amount? Uh, so, Bill, can you give Howie a, a microphone, please, so people downstairs can hear him? Is it appropriate to move from the floor to increase this? Sounds like you want to make an amendment. Yes. $750? Yes, I'd like to amend that to make it uh, $1,250. Okay. All right, so there's a, there's a motion on the floor to amend the article, all right? And uh, in order to amend the article, a little rusty here, excuse me. Um, So that's a majority vote to amend the article. So um, can I speak to it also? Uh, let's let it get on the floor first. See if somebody wants to second that motion. Second. Okay. So Al, I saw your hand first, Allison Trowbridge. Howie, uh, you have the right to speak on that first. So you have the floor. Uh, the school directors manage a half million dollar budget, and I don't think this fee has been raised in 20 years, to my recollection. So I think they more than deserve a little more compensation for the hard work that they're doing. Thank you. Okay. All right, any other discussion on the amendment to the article? Yes, David Cherry. Uh, can you have David a uh, microphone, please? I would agree that it should be increased, the amount of work that's going to be required, particularly when uh, the 100 rule comes in effect in July 2025 is going to be substantial and won't be able to be met with a meeting a month. Okay, any other discussion on the amendment? Okay, so now we're going to vote on the amendment. Okay, we're not voting on the article itself, we're voting on the amendment. There's been an amendment to change the amount of money in Article 3 from $750 to $1,250. Is that right, Howie? Yes. Okay. All right, we're going to vote on that. That requires a majority vote. So by show of hands, all those in favor of changing $750 to $1,250, please raise your hand. This is hard. <laughs> Usually Maureen's here to help me. <laughs> okay, um, you can put your hands down. I might ask you to do that again. All those opposed to increasing the school director's fee to 1250 and an amendment, please raise your hand. So it, it appears to me that the ayes have it. Uh, the ayes do have it and the amendment carries. So now we're going back into the article that amount has has been amended by vote to $1,250. Is there any discussion on this article before we vote on the article? See no discussion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion, the article three carries 
with $1,250 as part of the compensation. Thank you. Okay, Article 4. Shall the voters of the Wyndham School District approve the school board to expend $594,512, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year? Looking for a motion from the floor. Antia Rupert, so moved. I need a second. I saw Carol Bellucci's hand. So the motion has been brought forward. Antia, do you care to, to, to say any comments first? You have the right. Um, okay, all right. So Antia said she'd like to defer to Dan Roth. So Dan, would you like to have any comments on Article 4? Yeah, and I'm, I mean, this is not my budget, right? This is the board's budget. It's everyone's budget, right? But you know, I, I, I've spent the longest time looking at this budget, so I think I'm the most qualified to, to kind of speak to it. Uh, we passed around some information. Uh, so if you didn't get one of these, we do have uh, more of them up here. Yeah, absolutely. So the front part, right, really goes through, you know, it, it's an opinion piece, right? I have my bias, you know, I, I laid it out, right, along with the board. But, but the back is really where the nuts and bolts are, right? That's this is a collaboration with uh, Lori Garland at our supervisory union. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, if you look at your town report, right, see all the scribbles, right? A lot of that is what Heather uh, talked about earlier, our representative, where there's been a lot of shifting sands, right, when it comes to budgets all across Vermont. Um, yield changes, tax ca caps being eliminated and repealed, right? They just repealed another. Do we have some for downstairs? Oh, oh yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Careful. I got the moderator wants to steal it, I think. Oh. Yeah, please. Some of them have red text on them as well, so but it's the same There you go. Yes, point order. Oh, should I choke up? Yeah. Okay. I'll, okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll try to get a good hunch going. Oh. I'll give it a second for everyone to get settled, everyone to be reading from the same script here, you know, the same document. <laughs> no, 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 you just tell me how to operate here. All right. Do you? Oh, well, Dan still has the floor, so so you'll have your, your chance. Okay, and, and just to be clear, I mean, I, I want a chance for Abby and to Rory to also, mm -hmm. you know, it, this, is, this is the board's uh, you know, representation of the board's work, right, not my own. So I just want to make sure that that's clear that, you know, that they're free to of course. You know, interact with us. Okay, yep. cool. So, I mean, the biggest, the biggest jump that you see just right from the start, right, when you look at the actual breakdown of the budget, right, the summary page, is that we're up 26%, right, percent variance. And that's true. Uh, you know, as I noted in the front, you know, a lot of that is due to all the programming, right, that we packed into this. You know, one, one thing that came through through the legislature is uh, Act 127. You know, I mentioned the tax cap, but there's other effects to it, right? Going back to it, uh, we have new weights on how we count pupils, right? And a lot of the benefit went to the small towns, right, such as ours, where we have appreciated, because of that act, uh, a lot more contribution to our budget. And the fact is, is that we can uh, pack our budget full of 
uh, you know, programming that we desperately need, right? Stuff that, you know, other parents, you know, that a lot of this feedback of, okay, music, art, library and media, curriculum, counseling, this all came from surveys, this all came from meetings, uh, directly from parents. And so that's what we try to represent here. Now the other thing I wanna note is the, the first update, right? And, and once again, this is direct conversation with the SU, with the Director of Finance, Lori Garland, right? So these are not numbers that I came up with whole cloth. These are numbers blessed by and understood and, and discussed in detail with the SU. The yield. The yield has, it, it's a number that figures into how we calculate the tax rate, right? The state provides it and we use, we use it to, you know, layer it into our budget. The yield has been going up, right? Especially since, uh, and, and the implication is as the yield goes up, right? The, the lower the tax rate, the more that we can get from our budget. And that yield is pro projected to continue to go up. I think, what, a week ago, uh, it went up another $10. So even this is inaccurate, right, to this time. It's projected to go up, I think, to 10K is what Lori actually commented, right? That it, she's predicting it could go up to 1025, right? And that's, that's huge. That's huge because that'll keep driving the, the tax rate down. Uh, if anything, you know, I did some rough numbers with her. If it goes up another 250, that's another 10 cents off. Another 250, it's another 10 cents off, right? So, so getting down to it, right, we have our tax rate, the total tax rate before CLA. And we have the comparison between last year and this year, right, FY24 and FY25. Now, you can see from the percent variance that it has increased 17%. But the other numbers that have appreciated is our CLA from our listers. Provided by our listers is the assumption that we run on that our, our homesteads are properly uh, appraised at market value, right, up to 95%. Now, that number could be higher as well. Uh, we don't know. They, you know, the, the fact is we're not gonna know for this vote. But that's the projection that we have, so that's what we're rolling with. But last year, it was 70%, which is it's a huge, that, that's also huge, because that divides into our raw tax rate, right? That 169, that's what caused a dollar 42 to become $2.01 in FY24. But for us, now that we're here, 95% divides into it, and we're actually at 178 as of this writing. Like I said, the yield, you know, you could argue that there's still numbers that are waiting to be updated. And indeed, there's another $10, which may equal a cent or two, right? A point of a cent. But regardless, right now, as of writing, we have 11% decrease in tax rate. And that's just a fact. It's provided by the SU, and that's exactly what they have provided and told us. Okay, thank you, Dan. You guys have anything else to add? I, I'm impressed with how much um, was able to get into this budget. So I know it took a lot of work in trying to figure out um, how things would kind of play, but I'm, I'm very proud of this. and. Um, I hope, hope people can see the benefit of that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of value coming from this budget, right? And you know, getting out of taxes, getting out of dollar amounts, out of budget numbers, this is programming for kids, all of this, right? Uh, all of this programming is gonna directly benefit the kids of our town. And hopefully, you know, my daughter, you know, when it comes time. And I, I didn't even bring up other stuff like, okay, the cost per pupil also down 15, you know, 14 uh, and a half percent almost, right? The statewide average for that number, that cost per pupil, I, I think is 18 and a half thousand. That's 8% less than the state average. So our cost per pupil is lower than other towns. Thank you, Dan. 
Um, any other discussion? I saw your hand, Russ. Uh, can you wait for, wait for a microphone, please? I've been a lister for uh, six years, and unfortunately, Dan does not understand the yield formula. Uh, last year, the yield was $15,600, and it was reduced under $10,000. <clears> as the yield increases, as the go to 15000 the tax rate comes down. If the yield drops, the tax rate goes up. So effectively, Dan is not correct in saying that as the yield rises or as the yield um, c comes up, the taxes are going to go down. That's exactly false. As the yield comes up, <clears throat> you end up having um, a, a higher tax rate than, than you would if the yield keeps, you know, if the yield falls. So the, the whole point here is that if you tuition the students, you would have $470,000 worth of budget and you would back out $6,000 worth of legal fees, you would back out $5,000 for alternate transportation, you would also back out $48,000 for the building, which would bring the total budget to $464,000, which is $110,000 less than what they're proposing. The tax rate at that level be, would be a buck and a half, and I have gone over this with Lori, and it's correct. Any other discussion? Uh, not until everybody's had a chance to speak. Howie? There's a question from the floor downstairs. Okay, I'll, I'll get that person next. I've, I've okay. called on Howie. Howie? Um. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I served on the Leland and Gray School Board for over 20 years, and I can tell you from personal experience that school budgets in Vermont are a moving target. It is a roulette wheel. There is no way of predicting what your tax rate's going to be. There are just too many variables in the formula to, to come to a hard number at any year. But I will say from that same experience, 20 years, that the districts that have kept their schools open have done better. This year we've seen 30 districts vote their school budgets down. You go down that list, those are 30 districts that have either closed their schools mostly or become merged districts. Everybody remembers Act 46, how it was supposed to save everybody money? Well, back then when I was fighting to keep our district independent so we have control over our school, I told everybody, these merged districts are not going to save a nickel. They're going to cost more money. They have more administrative overhead. And time has proven me correct. So we've had our school here for over 200 years. And I've heard people you know, point to schools that have been in existence for 30 years as being more stable than our school. I moved here 26 years ago this was because this was a community that supported its school sent three kids to Wyndham Elementary School in Leland and Gray that have all turned out fabulous, are still friends with the kids they grew up in the town of Wyndham, gave them a childhood that, that other kids envy. You know, we're talking about nickel and dimes to keep up to, uh, and for opening and closing our school is a big mistake. We have to look at the big picture and what the value of a school is in our town. You know, you could save 10 cents on your tax dollar, but you're still, you're not going to have a school. If I told you, hey, I can save you, you know, 50% of your car payment, just give up your car. You'll have car choice. You'll have transportation choice. If I tell you, give up your house, you know, you know you'll save, I can save you 20% on your mortgage, but you won't have a house. You'll have house choice. This is what's being presented to us. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, an idea of giving away our school and giving up our town school to save a couple pennies on the tax rate this year with no guarantee of what's going to happen down the road and a very clear map showing what's happened to other towns whose tax rate has gone through the roof after they've implemented school closing, also known as school choice. So thank you very much. I hope everybody supports our town school budget as we always have. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. Is 
so there's somebody in the in downstairs wants to speak. Is that you, Kermit? Yeah. Okay, you have the floor, Kermit. It's so consistent that Russ will speak with such content. Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. We're, we're not going to go, no ad hominem attacks. Against I'm not the giving an ad hominem attack. It's an observation that we always hear about these figures that come from this great expertise. And I think that everyone, because of the tone of voice, kind of follows along that he must know more than everyone else. And that's misleading. So how many times have we marched down this bad faith argument where we get fudged figures? The school is super important and it needs to stop being this political football. Keep this school open. Thank you. Bridget, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, first, I want to apologize because I'm super nervous standing in a very crowded room talking, so bear with me. Um, when we're talking about passing this budget, there's, th there's an article for tuition, which we'll talk about later, but right now, the idea of passing this budget, I want people to think very long and hard about this because last year we passed a budget, and over the summer, a lot of us parents begged and pleaded with the board to tuition our kids out because it was not staffed. And time and time again, we were reminded that the town supported the budget, the town supported the school being open. And what happened this year was one of the worst experiences for my family and for my kids to the point that we, we had support in the school and we did the things and we were here for it. Um, they do not want to go back. Um, it was so awful and so traumatic, and we were constantly reminded that the town supported an operational budget. So right now, this decision is so important for what's to come next. Um, yes, there's a lot of programs. The board heard what we were saying that we wanted these programs, but what you all need to understand is right now, we're receiving those programs in another school because Wyndham had to be closed because Wyndham could not staff our school the way it needed to be staffed. I personally am working in education and I know what the candidate pool looks like. Teachers are leaving the field. It's not as simple as we have a budget with all of these programs. You have to find the people. I worked at the school and I know what it takes to be there. You need to find people that are going to work as hard as they can every day. And that is not easy to find right now. So it's very, very important for you to really think about what this budget vote means. And I urge you, as a parent who went through it, who has school-aged children right now, do not pass this budget because then we are stuck. Thank you. I'm Kathy Scott, I'm the treasurer of the school. Um, not a big job. Anyway, last year was an anomaly. It was a mistake on the, on the town's part, both the school and the select board and the school board, not to have town meeting in March. If we had had town meeting in March, there would have been time to hire appropriate staff. You should not hold the town hostage by voting down the budget because of an anomaly. Having a school in your town, we don't have a store, we don't have a post office, we don't have anything here except people. 65% of our homeowners are second homeowners. If the school is gone, what do we have? What do your children have as to where they come from? Support your school. The children who have graduated from Wyndham have gone on to do wonderful things. Yes, we need a better staff, but if we vote the budget in today, we will get a better staff. There will be time to hire, and yes, 
Teachers are leaving the field, but primarily teachers are leaving the field because parents are driving them out. I see Kathy Fails, Edgerly Fails hand. Okay, sounds good. Hi, I'm Kathy Fails. Um, I would like to speak for <clears throat> the children that are 15 years ahead, 20 years ahead. I think Howie made a great point about the 200 years. This is, we are in a trough. We have had some hard times. Nobody would think that what happened over the last couple of years was the good and best thing. But if we lose this budget and we lose this school, we lose something very important to the future of Wyndham. The, the, the children who are two years old now, the children who aren't even born yet, that we want to have a town that has a school. And if we don't support it in the really tough terrible times, it won't be there. We know that if we close it or if we don't approve it, we're not going to get it back. And I say, I know it's hard on the current parents and my heart goes out to them because they are really suffering at this time. But I think if we look ahead and we say, we want the parents in 20 years to look back and say, thank God the people in Wyndham held on to the school so that we can then enjoy it and benefit. OK, there's uh, someone downstairs, uh, is that Dan? Yeah, Mike, Dan Gorby. Um, i just like to kind of echo a little bit of what my wife said, but more in general, the fact that for seven years, we've lived in this town of Wyndham. For three years, my kids have been going to the Wyndham Elementary School. This past year, they were still in school. So everybody that says people just abandoned it, it's not true. Some of us were there. Some of us were also the ones who pointed out the flaws of the school while certain people on the board continued to deny things were happening and didn't want to take action. All that said, we have been asking for the things that are in this budget for the past three years in the school at Wyndham. And every single time it's been asked for, it's been shot down. And I believe the quote has been that it's not core curriculum. So now you're all willing to offer it up, make us pay even exponentially more for things that we're getting from other schools and that our kids are actually thriving. Our kids are thriving. Abby, you can shake your head no, but your husband is the one who consistently tells us that art, hey, math, no, no ad hominem attacks, please. Sorry. We are constantly told that art, counseling, music, and things like that are not part of core curriculum and we didn't need to budget for them. And it was what the families of this town had been asking for for three years. You're doing it now because it's a last ditch effort. And that's what it is, a last ditch effort. Thank you. Auntie, I see your hand. Uh, Bill, can you give Auntie the microphone, please? Thank you. I really want to thank the school board for their hard work getting this budget together under the very, very difficult conditions. Over the years, I, those who don't know me, I was on the school board for about 10 years. It's a pretty thankless job, I have to say. We try as much as we can, and yet it's never quite enough, or it's never quite the right thing for everybody. Um, the parents in this town, or some parents in this town, have repeatedly asked for extra curricular programs, for specific programs that the three of us here, Beth, Carolyn, and I, try to constantly pinch pennies in order to be fiscally responsible. Now this board, under the conditions that they had, put this budget together, and as Daniel laid out, our tax rate is actually going down. So I think it's really unfair to say that the school is not doing, or the school board is not doing its job and being attacked left and right and front and center. I think again, and I said that last year, this town should be so incredibly proud to have the Wyndham Elementary School here 
in our community. And I think our alumni or our current students or the parents of students, all the people that have gone through Wyndham Elementary are incredibly well-versed. They are a great example of what the school has done over the years and what the school can do in the future. So I really urge you to think hard about approving the budget because there are children in this town who really appreciate going to that school and there are parents in this town who really appreciate going to that school. Those who don't think it's the right place, they have all the possibilities to find something else, but don't mess it up for those who really appreciate having a school. Thank you. Okay, I see Meredith. It is like a knife through my goddamn heart to hear. My heart goes out, but we have to think about the people who will be students at this school in 15 or 20 years. Like, they don't exist yet. They may never exist. I don't think they're as important as the children who do exist. Yes, you're right. There are families who are happy with this school, but they are not in the majority. And I think that for all of us who have school-aged children who have elected not to put our kids there at all differing levels of personal cost, to hear that like that's our personal choice or like, mm -hmm, like this is happening now. This is not about 15 or 20 years from now. The mythical young families who are gonna move here, like I'm not literally young, but I am mother of a young child and I'm here now. And I'm not some future person who might exist. I'm here now and I am telling you now that this is what we need and I don't care about the 15 or 20 years from now. I care about now and I need, if you all are gonna pay lip service to this idea that young children, oh, the families with the young children, oh, which I've been hearing about for the entire time I've been coming to these town meetings, these mythical families, we're here and we desperately need for you to see that we're here and hear what we're saying and I understand it is painful. You love the school for all kinds of reasons, many of which don't have to do with having gone there. I know, 200 years, yes, I get it, I, I, I resonate. But sometimes things change, the world moves on, and we gotta just like suck it up and go with it. And I really, it would mean a lot to me to know that you all heard what I'm saying. Nate, I saw your hand. How you doing? Uh, my name is Nathan Keel, and I've lived here since 1980. I don't know most of you, but I've been here since 1980, okay? I went through this school, personally went through this school. How many of you guys moving into the town have been through this school? Not many. My children went through this school, and I had to pull them I have traditionally voted with my parents to support this school as much as I could. And I've been told to move because I don't agree with this small vocal group who like to call us out, they like to call us names, they alienate our children in this school so much so that we had to pull them out. You don't understand that you want us to think of other people's children. We're trying to plan for our children. I want to leave this town. I despise living here. I don't feel welcome. I don't feel safe in my home. I had to put trespassing signs on my property. That's where we're at because we're standing up for democracy. So I ask you, what choice do we have? If you vote this budget through, my son can't go to Townsend anymore, and I have to pay out of pocket because there ain't no way in heck am I going to put him in that school because we are hated. And the people in this town don't separate. 
You may want to sit up here and cry, oh, poor school, poor school, but you don't act that way when you're not in this school. We asked for a bus schedule recently and were attacked. We were educated on how to speak properly. And all we said is, can you please provide a bus schedule? Every turn we get, we are attacked. And we're the only ones willing to stand up for our children, go to court, get attacked. I don't want to live in this town anymore. I've been here 40 years, 40 something plus. Can any of you guys say that? A lot of people have. Jimmy has. I went to school with him. We've been through this system. Can any of you say you have the experience that we have? You're talking about the little house on the prairie. I don't want, I'm not here to say you shouldn't have that. I'm here to say you should allow the parents to make the decisions that are best for their kids. My son had an IEP. He went to Townsend and he has graduated out of that now. He can't qualify to go there, so now we've got to come up with to pay the tax rate and extra so I can continue his education. And you want to tell me that we have all the options? What options do we have? If you pass this budget, we are proverbially screwed. I'm looking at selling my home, and I've been here since 1980. Do you think that's an option? It's fair for us? <clears throat> Does anyone think that that's fair? I'm sorry, be emotional. Thanks for listening. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I got eyes. Uh, yes, you, you have the floor. My name is Kate. I am the proud mother of two of the kids who went to Wyndham this year, uh, one of which is your only kindergartner. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say my kids lost educational time this fall. Uh, I am from Brattleboro. They are not. They are new here. So my kids just fell behind this year. And we're making that up in Townsend. And I'm going to be really factual about it. And I'm not I, that's important to me and how I conduct myself because I want you all to know that I'm coming from a really objective place on this. My kids fell behind. And now at a different school, they are falling back in line with where they need to be. I answer to the two little people that I live with that I made, and that is what I owe them. So I don't want to hold up the budget as a hostage point in this conversation, because that's not fair. And I'm not disputing that people didn't work very hard on it, but I'm a really proud resident of Wyndham. <laughs> I can be two things. I can be a proud resident of this town, and I can say that I'm really concerned about the education with it. Both of those things can be true. Okay, I see Rory's hand. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to point out um, on a positive note, there are a handful of current Leland and Gray students in this room that have graduated from Wyndham Elementary School, and they're here to support and do their civic duty, whether they're on one side of the fence or the other. And I just want everybody to know and acknowledge that they're here on their Saturday, and they're taking in all of this. And thank you guys for being here. If you guys want to stand up. Jack. Okay, any other discussion? Bill, I see your hand. Uh, Bill Casey, the three women in my life are all teachers, probably have 75 plus years of experience, all have bachelors, two have masters. My older daughter, I was talking to her recently, she had a class of 24 students, fourth grade, she said, Dad, I had two girls or two students who were very slow and two or three that were very advanced. It was extremely difficult to teach two dozen kids, a couple slow and some fast, in a one grade school. She said, if you're doing two, three, four grades, you need top 
quality, experienced people to teach those kids, not the clowns that were hired last year in desperation, probably because Charles Manson wasn't available. <laughs> Second, you go by Wyndham School at lunchtime. There's two kids there, one there, one there, one there, standing around, one in the parking lot, one in the driveway. Go down to Townsend, there's eight, 10, 12 kids kicking a ball, jump rope, rough, rough housing, doing things. They are getting a rounded education. The third thing is that a majority of the parents have spoken and said, give us choice. You, school board, should give them that choice. Thank you. I see Dave Cherry's hand. Dave Cherry. No, Bill. Dave Cherry. Uh, I'm Dave Cherry. Uh, I moved to Wyndham permanently probably 10 years ago, but have owned a house for 24. I just want to make a comment that I think everybody's focusing on the wrong thing. I hear from, from Nathan and, and whatnot uh, talking about their kids, and I think that's where you have to focus. The Constitution of the uh, Vermont demands that we offer equal quality education to all children. That's where we should focus. If you look at the timeline of 20 years, yeah, it'd be great to have a school here in 20 years. I personally don't care if it closes or not. I care that the kids get education. And I can't ethically think how you can deny families who didn't get that education, particularly highlighted in the last eight months of the Wyndham School, uh, the personnel were not adequate to deliver a quality, equitable education. And to sit in the end of July, not knowing what's going to happen in September of 2023, is not acceptable. And it's not acceptable because children need a stable environment and which is predictable, that they feel safe in, and have good leadership. And we had none of those. Zero. So the parents, if I was a parent, I would be very distraught that that was not offered. So I think that as you make decisions today, and they're difficult decisions, and I understand the school board, they put in hours trying to solve these things. Some of us think they're good decisions, some of us think they're bad, but they tried. And, and you can see through the eight months that I've closely observed this, that they're just normal citizens trying to do a good job, and their growth and understanding as they're in that job has been, you can see them grow. However, at the same time, you have children that are in this school that aren't getting what they need. And you balk at things like uh, music and whatnot. Those are essential for a kid who's very young. They don't know how to communicate. How do they communicate? They communicate by music. How do they interact with other people? Through play and music and extracurricular activities. They're not ready to, to handle the STEM, the science and whatnot, but they transition into that. But to have a child, these are critical years, and denying somebody six months, I was sort of thinking, you know, hey, there's kids here that have, haven't had anything for a stable environment for nine months or more. Well, how old are they? That's, that, that could represent 10 or 15% of their life that they haven't had a stable condition. So I ask you to focus when you're going to vote on these things, on the children and the best for the children and the best for the children that are here now. If you do the best for the children that are here now, Wyndham School will survive. If Wyndham School offers all these things, people won't tuition out and the school will survive. Okay, there's still people who have not had a chance to speak. Um, okay. I recognize George Dutton. Yeah, so I would um, just like to say something here. I've heard a lot about how this budget has been padded to add services um, to the school children and whatnot. I haven't heard a list of how these services would differ from this last year. 
that the kids went to school there, part of it. Is there going to be added staff members? Is there going to be, I mean, I guess I support the school. I just would like to know how it's going to be better than it was. Michael, could you have uh, George repeat that, please? I guess I support the school. I just want to know how it's going to be better this coming year uh, than the last eight months. Um, I hear that there's added services and the number might be larger um, because they're adding services and just like a little bit more of a description as to what these services will be. Dan, do you care to answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, just going through it, right? Um, let's just look at the town report. So part of the information sheet, right, we talked about significant investment. Uh, so let's just start on, so it's 47 through 49, but I'm, I'm going to talk generally about it, right? So music and art, right? There are line items within this budget to specifically bring on instructors, right? Instructors for billable hours that are able to come in and work with the children. These are not volunteers. These are, sorry, these are not volunteers. These are not uh, non-licensed folks. These are folks that are licensed for their profession and are coming in and will be additional staff at the school within their billable hours. And that's the same for library and media services. There's a librarian that comes in. Counseling and social work, there is, uh, we already have a counselor, but I think we doubled is that correct? The, uh, yes. the, uh, the counseling. So that's additional time that another adult, that another adult, sorry, I keep going away from the mic. It, it's an additional time for another adult in the room working with kids, right, within their billable hours. Uh, all of those services have additional folks that are gonna be at the school, including the after school program, right? Another, another adult, right, licensed, professioned and will watch over the kids and interact with them, play with them, teach them, right? Like this is something that brings us, I mean, you know, speaking to Act 127, right? The, and previous boards and the difficult decisions that they've had to make. I, I can't step into their shoes. I'm not them, right? But we inherited, you know, as, as one parent has told me before, we inherited their choices, right? And I understand that. And the other thing that comes from Act 127 is that they didn't have that, right? That they had to work really closely to skim the budget, right, to, to keep the tax rate down. We don't have to do that here. And we have all these additional adults that are gonna be in the room along with either two teachers and a, a principal or a, a teacher and a, prince and a teaching principal and an admin. And so that's a lot of licensed folks right, run by the SU, background checked, right, that will add, a, a, add additional stability, you know, speaking to, you know, what David was saying. Is there anybody else who wants to speak before? Oh, um, Al, Al, uh, can we have a microphone for Al McLean? Hello, friends and neighbors. I'm Alan McLean. I would like to say that talking about the school being here for many years really doesn't make a difference because it's not a cogent argument for me. It's always been here. I think that sometimes a change is an important thing. Leaving things the way they are can be an impediment to progress. I'm a resident of Wyndham since 2020. I came here with a master's of education, 20 years of experience being a consultant in schools, both urban, suburban, and rural. And my experience has always been the, the quality of a school depends upon the faculty, depends on the administration, depends on the services that are provided to children, 
who have special needs, reading specialists, math specialists, behavioral specialists, general education specialists, special education specialists. I'm not sure that, that those programs are actually guaranteed. Daniel, you mentioned all of these things are going to happen, but it's looking to the future. It's not the reality right now. You're hoping that this is going to be the case. I hear the parents talk about what they have experienced, and they have not experienced quality staff, quality teachers, or the support that students need to have success. And I thank you all for my, listening to my comments. Actually, Dan, did you want to respond? Did you have something? Uh, it was actually a response to a, a number of other okay. comments. You know, just, just speaking to the kind of beats of the actual budget, right, and how the numbers interact. So I did look up the yield, and I just want to make sure that, I want to make sure that you guys have the facts, right? Regardless of how the vote goes, whether or not you want the school needs to be based on the facts that you have, right? It needs to be based on you have all the information. So let's just say that the yield was $10 and the cost per pupil was $20, right? The cost per pupil divides into the yield, right? So in that case, 20 divided by 10, that's two, okay? Let's say we bump that yield up to 20. 20 divided by 20 is $1. So the fact is, as you increase the yield, which is projected, right, we're just talking about tax, right, and I understand that hasn't been the conversation, but I just want to get back to, you know, but I, I do think we need to be concerned about the children. I mean, I'm not a mythical family that moved in and saw, saw this town, saw the school, and loved it, right, and had a kid and, you know, can't wait for her to, to learn and grow. But I just want to make sure you understand the tax implications. It's correct that as the yield goes up, the tax rate does go down. Okay, I saw Crystal's hand. Crystal. I have two questions. One, where are you going to find these people to fill all these magical services in this budget? And two, I'm wondering if you guys can tell me about the uh, new reading curriculum implemented by the WCSU, because I didn't see one Wyndham board member at that board meeting, um, which I find interesting since we're all yelling about education. One of my biggest concerns is the fact that my grandson had a first grade reading level, but was in fourth grade. So I would think our board would be very interested in the reading curriculum implemented that all the schools around them, the schools we're all currently in, will be using next year. Dan? Yeah, just, just commenting on that, there is actually a line item uh, for curriculum. So Jen Cusack, she's the director of uh, curriculum uh, within the uh, supervisory union. So when we had uh, obviously a, le a leave of absence for our teaching principal, right, she came in personally and devoted her time not only to filling in the role as teaching principal, but also doing a gap analysis. So she did a gap analysis of what, how much curriculum, specifically K-5 to reading and English. And there are line items, uh, specifically books and periodicals. Uh, I think it's, yeah, uh, the variance percent is 820% increase, right, in the amount of curriculum. And most of that is that K-5, and it's directly from Jen Cusack. So I want to make sure you guys know that as well. Okay, um, Allison? I call the question. 
Okay, yeah, no, that's a clarification that the, the budget, thank you for pointing that out, Mac. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what Mac said, just, just one moment, please. Um, I, I just wanna make it clear that there's been a motion to call the question, okay? And I see a second from Ali Cummings, okay? And what this means is it ends discussion, right? That's a two-thirds majority vote. We are gonna end discussion and vote on the article. And uh, so we're gonna vote on ending discussion right now. Everybody understand that that's what we're voting on? Okay, so all those in favor of calling the question and ending discussion on Article 4, say aye. Aye. Okay, and all those opposed, downstairs you can raise your hand, upstairs say nay. Okay, so uh, the motion to call the question passes, and uh, we're going to now go into voting for Article 4. So, um, okay, uh, just one second, Kathy. Let me repeat the article so everybody knows, and then I'll, I'll recognize you. So, uh, just to be clear, Article 4 was amended based on the previous article that increased by $1,500. So we're actually going to be voting on 5960112, if my math is correct. Um, you carry the one. 596012 is what I'm coming up with. Is that right? Okay. 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 So. Um, I'll reread the article and then there's a motion for paper ballots. Shall the voters of the Wyndham School District approve the school board to expend $596,012, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. Okay, and there's a motion for paper ballots. I need seven voters to agree. Can't raise your hand twice. Okay, I see seven hands, so um, we're gonna do it by paper ballot. So same routine as last time when we voted for the officer. Uh, we'll go pew by pew and then utter chaos. Does that sound good? <laughs> okay. So we'll start. Um, actually, we're going to start over here first. You guys, you guys can go first. Uh, well, wait, until, wait until the town clerk's got it set up. All right. So there were, on this Article 4, 137 ballots cast. Noes 77, yes is 60, article, fail, article 4 fails. Okay, uh, we're moving along with the business of the day and I'd like to take my orders from the body because it's, it's uh, getting late in the day, but um, I wanna get a feel from everybody if we wanna move through school meeting or if we wanna have an adjournment for lunch. Um, I'm getting the sense that everybody wants to continue until we finish the school meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. That was a straw poll, by the way. Okay. Um, so moving on to Article 5. Shall the voters of the Wyndham School District authorize the moving of the operational surplus, if any, from fiscal year 2024 to the capital reserve? Looking for a motion from the floor. There's a motion, Russ coming. Looking for a second, Rachel Spengler. Okay, Article 5. Shall the voters of the Wyndham School District authorize the moving of the operational surplus, if any, from fiscal year 2024 to the Capital Reserve? Any discussion? Russ. Uh, hold on one second. Um, we're gonna get you a microphone. I think it's very appropriate that we move that to the Capital Reserve Fund because in a recent study for the facilities condition assessment of the Wyndham Elementary School, the first item on one of the pages says that there's $148,000 worth of repairs that are needed to the building. They're listed as poor, poor, fair, poor, poor, poor. Many of them are poor and they total 148,000 and there's not one dime 
in the school budget that was proposed to us today to cover the necessary repairs as offered by the Agency of Education for the building. In the second year, there's $77,000 worth of repairs that are needed, and none of that money was included in the estimate of the cost of, of, the, of the school. So putting the $95,000 aside is a very prudent and reasonable thing to do. Thank you. Okay, and any other discussion on Article 5? Okay, seeing no other discussion, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of Article 5, say aye. Aye. And aye. any opposed, say nay. And downstairs, raise your hand. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 5 passes as written. Article 6. Shall the school board of the Wyndham School District provide for the elementary education of students by paying tuition in accordance with law to one or more public elementary schools in one or more school districts for the 2024-2025 school year and continuing thereafter? Looking for a motion from the floor. Allison moves the article. Looking for a second. I see Nancy Tip's hand. Okay, any discussion, Allison? Oops, you have the right to speak first if you want. Uh, wait, please wait for. Uh, thank you. Which Allison was that, please? Trowbridge. Trowbridge. Thank you. Hi. Um, I guess I wanted to say that even though this is a. Um, this article talks about school choice. If it passes, it takes away the choice of going to the Wyndham School for the kids who like it and are doing well there. So um, it's just one of those things that someone's going to win and someone's going to lose, and we can't make everyone happy. But it's, it's just a difficult situation, and I hope for the best for everyone. Thank you. Any other discussion? Nancy, I saw your hand. Actually, I agree with Allison, and I certainly don't wish anyone here any ill. Um, but one thing that I did want to say was, would that make you snicker? No. Oh, sorry. I thought you were <laughs> snickering. Um, anyway, I actually don't wish anyone any ill. And what I wanted to say was that I feel as though the situation of a school as small as ours is, is an extremely fragile situation. And it worked really well for all those years when we had a couple of folks who were dedicated, long time, completely um, dedicated to making it work. And when they left, I think that w it would be helpful if even the most stubborn and stiff-necked among us would agree that that was the end of an era. I think you have to accept that. When Mr. PJ and Sally no longer were the teachers, that was the end of an era. And you're probably... This is not addressing the issue. Oh, oh, really? Do tell. I think it's addressing the issue because what I'm saying is a school as small as this one is an extremely fragile situation. And the fact that we're now left with an era that isn't at all like the era that has ended, for one thing, the parents are really different and they have other needs and other wishes. And I think it would be really helpful if we recognize that and if we also recognize that we've got parents now who have certain needs that aren't just like the ones in the past, and they're not just like the ones in the future. Okay. Any other discussion? Jerry, I see your hand. Yep. Then uh, I am, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm old now. Hi, I'm Gerald Amston. I'd like to know where the idea of getting rid of Wyndham School came from in the first place. I think it came from people that came from other states or places that 
had bigger schools and they think that, that the schools here should be like they were where they came from. Um, I had a good education here. I went on, I worked at Erskine's Grain Store in Chester for almost 32 years. I, I was all right in math in high school. Of course, I learned more when I worked, but um, anyhow, um, I don't understand why somebody wants to close the school when if things had been run the way they'd always been run and nobody rose any question, um, they'd have the teachers in the education that we want, but somebody just decided that all of a sudden Wyndham School was too small and, um, you know, just no good. But uh, I myself, I think it, it was good because I got a good education there. But, but anyhow, I, and I don't agree with voting down the school budget either. Okay. Howie? Uh, please wait for the microphone so people downstairs can hear you. Yeah, I hope that everybody who supports the school stays to vote this uh, down. We still have an option to keep our school even though the budget wasn't approved. The school board can bring back another budget at a lower rate we can still have our school. Um, and that's, that's the facts. I, I agree with Jerry Amsden. There are countless kids who have had a great educational experience at our school. Coming up, we have an option, to, parents have an option to be part of the hiring process for new teachers. You know, when I was, when my kids were here, I was on the committee that hired Mickey Parker Jennings. Parents today have the same opportunity to give feedback to hiring a new staff at our school. Those jobs are plum jobs. The last two teachers we had before this past unfortunate year were here for 25 years apiece. These are not jobs, these are plum jobs that many teachers would be happy to have. So I, I hope everybody remains here and stays to vote this down so we can keep our school. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. Bridget, I saw your hand in the back. Hi, it's Bridget again. Um, I'm hoping that everyone here will consider voting for choice. Um, I fully understand how hard this is for a lot of folks in town. Um, and I know that there's a lot of you that really do genuinely love the school and have had wonderful experiences and their children went and they had great experiences. But I need you to understand that that's not what we were offered this year and that matters. Uh, we've talked a lot about kids in the future and we've referenced the situation as like a snafu, like whoops, this happened and that's behind us. It's not behind it for the kids and they matter. Um, what happened was so awful, and I, I've often heard it referred to as just as like an accident and it happened, we're moving past it. That burned a bridge with a lot of the kids. The children that were there were not okay. After the principal was terminated, we got together as parents and talked about it with the supervisor union. Dan was there, um, and it was really telling to me how across the board everyone was struggling. There's not many times that we gather in this town in groups and we all share an opinion, but um, it was really unifying in the fact that we were all really upset and our kids were really upset and our kids weren't doing well. Um, we had a very smooth transition to Townsend. Um, both of my kids had a hard year. I, I bumped one of mine down a grade in the transition and he's thriving. And I had another one that was just really struggling with the day to day and coming home on a daily basis and crying and not wanting to go to school, which has never been our experience. They, what happened has changed their view of Wyndham Elementary School. And we as a community own that. We sit here and we tell the parents to get more involved or we yell at the school board that they're not doing a great job. The reality is, is we all own this. We put pressure on the board to keep a school open even though they don't have a staff. We ask to have a budget put forward even though it's bleak. I am begging this community to put the kids first and stop talking about how 
the school is the heart of the community and the school, if we lose the school, we lose the community. That puts the responsibility on young children to keep us together. We as adults have the chance to come together on our own and be kind humans and work together and have community events without putting our kids through that school. I think reopening the school and not allowing families to ask to tuition somewhere else is continuing to put them at risk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who is that person? It's Kermit. He's coming. Okay. Okay, Kermit, you have the floor. You know, I, um, in hearing uh, a few, uh, it's been a few months back uh, when I first heard that there were a number of parents who were very unhappy. I, I, I hadn't heard. Uh, that there were problems at the school uh, until everybody else had. And it was pretty devastating because I really thought that with the new uh, the new teacher, uh, that things were going to really improve and, and, and what have you. And, and that was just super sad. But I just want to remind everybody that um, this uh, the discussion about the students during the pandemic, this school managed to stay open when most schools in the country were closed. And during that entire period of time, you had the same group of people. And, and mind you, I, I, I can't help but really feel for parents whose kids are not getting what they need. So I'm, I really don't wanna minimize that at all. But there has been this really active um, campaign of misinformation and just stirring things up this whole time, and they basically ran out the people who had been teaching at that school for all those years, and then her basically harassing the people that just came in. It's just been a, a, a nonstop campaign to close that school, almost like a vengeance. And it's heartbreaking. Um, and just one you know, other quick thing, I just think if everybody would go and, and have a walk around the cemeteries of Wyndham, have a look at all the people who have paid taxes in this town for 200 years. Look at the people who built Wyndham. You might have lived here your entire life, but there are generations of people who have lived here. And I think that we owe it to Wyndham to maintain the school. It is just heartbreaking to imagine that any community would intentionally close its school. Nate, I saw your hand. Hi. Uh, I just want to comment a little bit on something I see happening that I, it doesn't sit right with me. We're voting on school choice for tuition out, right? That's what we're voting on. Are we voting to close the school? Because every, everyone up here, is, I agree that it's an unfortunate circumstance that may happen if the tuition happens but we are not voting on closing the school we are voting on whether or not parents with children in this community your community have the right to decide what is best for their children do you want me to tell you what's right for your children do you want me to tell you how to live and how to raise your children? But you want to tell me that this is what's right. I've been this, through this system as well, and I still have children in this system. I went to that school. I went to Leland and Gray. I want the choice to decide what is right for my child. I don't want the school to close because that would make all y'all not happy. And then you would attack us more. You would blame us for years to come because I want the right to be a parent and choose what's right, not have somebody tell me this is where your kid has to go or you have to sell your house. And it, that the reason that you have to change, that is because the community wants a school. I'd love to see that school succeed. And what the problem is here, you're all twisting this 
so you all feel sorry about closing the school, but the vote is whether or not I have the right to decide what's right for my child. Okay. Dan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mike. Um, I've been hearing the rhetoric for three plus years now that there's a small group of people in this town that have a vengeance out to shut the school. I just like to make everybody aware that that small group of people happen to be 60% of the parents in the town of Wyndham with school aged children. Not people that don't have kids in the school, not people that had kids that went through the school 60 something years ago and had a great experience. I'm glad you all did. It's great. And I'm glad you support your school the way you did. That's not the school of today. That's not the modern times. That is not what Wyndham has been to my kids for three plus years at this point in time. It needs to realize and recognize that today, all of the staunch supporters for the school I don't believe one of them has a child in, in the school currently. And what you're hearing from is the majority of parents that are asking to what Nathan just said, give us the choice for our own kids. You have the choice for yours. Give us the choice for ours. We've been held hostage here for three years. Thank you. I see Dave Cherry's hand. Um, just to reiterate what I said before, the uh, state of Vermont constitution mandates that you give equal opportunity education to these children. We have not demonstrated doing that. If you have a line item in a budget that says you, we will act on this and that, well, uh, there's no guarantee that's gonna happen. Parents of this town need the assurance that their children will receive uh, an opportunity to equal and quality education for this year, not next year, not the year after that, that it may require to rebuild Wyndham School. And again, this motion is not to close the school. I don't care whether it closes or not myself. I'm willing to pay more taxes. Uh, the taxes are not the issue. The quality of education for the kids is. So when you vote, think about that as a as an item uh, and I think that uh, at this point there's no way to guarantee uh, that next year uh, all of the uh, desirable items will be implemented therefore I think parents should have a choice the actual uh, statutes that are going to take effect as of July 225 state that it doesn't even have to be a public school. It has to be a qualified school under the, the state of Vermont. So uh, right now we're sticking to public schools, but parents should have a choice if they don't have the option in town. And we don't have the option now. Thank you, thank you. I see Dan's hand. Yeah, I, I just want to speak towards, you know, just strictly the budget here, right? And strictly towards the article, right? Yes, it, it does not specifically say that this closes the school, but I will say from a budget standpoint, being operational as well as having less students and tuitioning those students that get siphoned from the budget is untenable. There is no way to simultaneously run an operational budget such as what we have here, and simultaneously tuition kids to another place. So it may be an indirect effect, but it is an effect. Thank you. Aaron, I see your hand. Here we go. Hi, I wanna bring this back to the families and the kids in the town. I did an independent survey and I sent that out to all the school-aged children in this town. It was about 20 emails. Um, I got 11 responses. Out of those 11 responses, only two families wanted to keep their kids in Wyndham. 
the rest of the 11 responses, sorry, minus that two, wanted to go to Townsend, continue to go to Mountain School, or Floodbrook. So only two families out of the current school-age children of Wyndham want to go to Wyndham. So let that sink in. So the people that didn't respond, there are some here today that have spoken out that did not respond to that survey, that I feel that they, by what they've responded, don't want to, so we can add another one to that. But that is not on my data. That your family's included. Yes, your family and another family is included. So the rest of the families that filled out that survey don't want to send their kids to Wyndham. I think that holds something right there in the way you guys should vote today. Again, it's about the kids. I see the kids every day. I also worked at the school the previous year, so I know the children. I go and pick up my son from pre-K, and all the kids come out before they get on the Wyndham bus, and you see this cord. They're happy to see me. They say, hey, Erin, how are you? They're so happy, they're telling me about their day. They're like, we love this school. I don't know what else you know, matters than that. The kids are happy. The kids are happy in towns and that I've seen. The kids are happy in mountain school, what I've seen. I go to both schools. I drive to Townsend, I drive up the road to mountain school, I pick up the kids. I see them interact with other children daily. I saw this at Wyndham. They are definitely more socially prepared in these other, other schools than they were in Wyndham. They're happy, they're smiling. No one's crying, no one's sleeping in class, no one's fighting on the bus. It all seems good. Let them continue to be happy. Let them continue to thrive. I see Michael Pelton's hand. Last year was a mess. I think we can all agree. Nobody wants to do that again. Hopefully ever. Um, I think it's clear that everybody wants what's right for the kids. I think it's clear that everybody should be mad about what happened last year. I think it's also clear that there have been some concerns, and there are concerns about how things may or may not progress, whether the school is going to be supportive, if it remains open or not, um, because if we do vote to um, do school choice, it will close the school. That's also clear. Like, that's how it works. Um, but what you need to know is this. The school can be supported. In fact, the school is required to be supported by the supervisory union. So if you do not believe that our kids are getting a fair and edu ed equitable education, then you need to have a conversation with a supervisory union. That is what the supervisory union's job is. If there's a failure to educate, it is their responsibility. If there's a failure for a child to get special ed needs met, that is a failure on the supervisory union. It's not their fault. It's not the teacher's fault. It's the supervisory union's job to oversee the operation of the school and the education that occurs there. If the curriculum's not there, they have failed us. They've failed our students, our teachers, and our community. So if you want to get mad, have a conversation with your supervisor union that's not doing its job. I highly hope and recommend that we choose to keep the school open. Thank you. Dad, I see your hand. Al. Oh. Pass that down. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I urge all the people who are going to make a choice to listen to the parents who have kids in the school. The school is just a building on Wyndham Hill Road. We should be friends of the kids, not just friends of the school. I urge everybody 
to pay attention to what the parents have said and put that in their hearts when they make a vote. Thank you. Yes, um, we have somebody who wants to speak. Hi, I just, in the interests of keeping this all based on accurate information, um, I know that when this first vote came up, there was a lot of information that got sent out about how great it would be for the Wyndham kids to go to Floodbrook School. I've worked teaching in the Floodbrook School for 22 years. They did not say they were going to have the kids come to Floodbrook. So that, that option is not on the table right now, as far as I know. So just don't consider that if you vote for choice, your kid's going to Floodbrook. Okay. Um, thank you, Kate. Okay. Kathy? Yes. education and your parent oh your parents r rights as parents to have some to have some say in your child's education okay but you're ob if we vote to do this now you're turning your child's education over to the supervisory union to the supervisory union you may be happy with the supervisory union this year but as was stated by Michael can you count on that are you sure? If you send them to Floodbrook, can you count on that? If you send them to Jamaica, can you? If you have them here, you have a say. If you send them there, you're muddy in the waters. Dave, I'll call on you in just a minute until somebody else has had a chance to speak. Crystal, I see your hand. So I just want to point out some fallacies about the supervisory union. As uh, having two children, they have 504s. To say the supervisory union is responsible for all their special ed is absolutely incorrect. The teacher contacts the supervisory union to get an assessment done. When you don't have a reliable teacher to do so, those things don't happen. Unless your child has a special ed diagnosis that qualifies them for a one-on-one -on -one or a para, it then becomes the school's responsibility. And because Wyndham is so small, they can't afford to hire support staff. So it's supposed to fall on the teachers that are there to provide extra support for kids who do not qualify for one-on-one. -on -one. So that I felt needed to be clarified. how that works. <laughs> Having a child with uh, has a, an IEP and 504, very familiar with the process that's incorrect. The supervisory union and special education are responsible for the special education provided. Okay. I saw a hand next to Crystal. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Did you want to speak? I'm a parent of two boys who have been in Wyndham School for the past four years, and I just want to describe the experience as traumatic to all of you. It's been awful, and they deserve a real education. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on this article? Dave. I, I just want to make it clear, and I talked to Bob Tebow about this and sent him an email. Uh, as I started to look into the quality of, of education. The town of Wyndham is a district. It's not part of the supervisory union. Leland and Gray may be, 
but uh, the town of Wyndham chose not to be in it. So the school board uh, is responsible for assuring the quality of education in this town. They do have the superintendent to help them with that. And yes, you can hire the supervisory union to do your uh, book work and whatnot, but the actual responsibility on my read, and I checked it with uh, the superintendent, is the school board is responsible. So I don't think we can pass the buck anywhere. It sits with everybody in this room. Myself and every single resident of, of Wyndham is responsible for making sure the kids get a good education now. Any other discussion? Yes, Antal. Um, Bill, would you mind bringing the microphone up, please? Hi there. Um, uh, I feel like the school is already shut down, and why are we discussing trying to fix a broken egg? It's already been settled with with children going to schools where they're doing well, and it seems like it's gonna cost a fortune to reopen the school, if and when the busloads of magic kids are coming to populate that school, why isn't that, that issue revisited at that time? It seems like we should stick with what's best for the students now and send, let them have their choice. Thank you. Okay, um, Antia, do you have a comment? Pass that over, please. I just want to clarify what David Cherry just said. It is not true. Just because Wyndham is not in the um, West River MUED in that uh, district, the SU or the WCSU is still definitely responsible to oversee and supervise what's happening at the Wyndham School. And that includes assessments and the hiring of special teachers, including special ed, arts, and so on and so forth. It is not true to say that because Wyndham is not part of that district, it is still part of the WCSU and that supervisory union is there to supervise what the board does and what happens at the Wyndham School. Thank you. Oh. Okay, is there any other discussion on Article 6? Seeing no other discussion, we're going to go into the vote. Um, do we want to do this by a show of hands? Okay. Okay. Did you have a motion, Russ? Okay, there's a motion and a second for a paper ballot that requires the hands of seven voters. Okay, there are seven hands at least. So we're going to do paper ballots again. So I would ask that, uh, that everybody be patient and we'll do the same thing again that we've done the last two votes for paper ballots. I'd ask that everybody go as, as quietly as possible. So, so uh, here, can I have your attention, please? Well, excuse me. I'm still speaking, so can people please listen to what I'm saying? Thank you. So what we're voting on is Article 6, as it's written. A yes vote passes the article as it's written and gives school choice to public elementary schools. A no vote defeats the article as it's written. Okay, so yes is for the article to pass. No is if you're opposed to the language in the article. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, all right, thank you. Can I have your attention, please? Uh, we, again, congratulations to the body. We don't have to do this again. So, um, so this was for school choice article six. There were 127 voters, uh, 82 voted yes, 45 voted no. Article six carries.
I'd just like to say um, thanks to everybody because that was a, a very difficult and emotional and, and I appreciate it that everybody respected each other's voices during the meeting. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, we are now still in the school board meeting, Article 7. Okay. Shall the voters authorize the school board to petition the State Board of Education to regroup Wyndham School District into a different supervisory union pending the formulation and review of a needs assessment? Looking for a motion from the floor. Jenny, the, the motion has been moved by Jenny Crittenden. Need, need a second? A second by Bill Casey. Okay, Article 7. Shall the voters authorize the school board to petition the State Board of Education to regroup Wyndham School District into a different supervisory union pending the formulation and review of a needs assessment? Looking for a discussion on Article 7. I saw your hand first, Ms. Perret. Right here. Yes? Okay. <laughs> How does that pertain to, like, the vote that just passed? Can I go there? There we go. Um, so that's a great question. Um, we are, if we are tuitioning and we are not part of a supervisory union, um, you know, that's, I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm not, I'm not certain um, what that would look like as far as um, when it comes to choice and wanting to tuition and availability at the different various schools, if it makes sense to still want to be a part of a supervisory union, not having an operational school, what does that look like and how does it make it easier for families to ensure that if they want all of their children to go to a specific school, what does that look like or is it gonna be they only can take so many students, so do families end up getting split up because there's not an opportunity where, similarly to what uh, happened in the um, fall where the students were tuitioned to um, Townsend Elementary, that was through the same supervisory union that we are a part of. So the superintendent was able to say, this is the school can take these children under his direction, essentially. Um, so, that's a lot different than not belonging to something and not belonging to a supervisory union and then trying to you know ensure that families are getting um where they need to go for their choice so um this this was most importantly done for uh to get the needs assessment um which is a it conducts a thorough and objective needs assessment to evaluate the current and desired outcomes and strengths and um weaknesses of the school district um, identify potential differences in costs and benefits, uh, implications and uh, feasibility if, we, if there was um, information that would indicate we should withdraw from the SU. Um, what would that look like? It would establish a clear timeline and um, an action plan for the withdrawal process should that be what is decided. Uh, and it could identify the tasks and responsibilities and resources um, and the milestones for each phase of the process. So that is what the needs assessment is as far as petitioning um, the, the Board of Ed. Um, so as far as having school choice, the district still exists. So it doesn't make the district go away. Does the district want to continue working with the supervisory union that we have, Wyndham Central Supervisory Union, or is there interest to have this needs assessment completed um, and see what information that brings forward and how to best support the families in their decisions going ahead. So. Okay, thank you. Yep, okay. um, so one point was you had referenced not being a part of a supervisory union. I, 
I believe we have to. Um, so even if you were looking into switching, I don't think that you can, I don't think we as a town can vote to not be a part of a supervisory union. I'm not 100% sure on that, but just something to consider. Um, I would also consider not passing this now because um, Abby's answer was she's not totally sure based on everything that just happened. Um, is it a good idea to vote on something that we don't really understand what the implications are with this new situation? So with that, the, um, the, the district exists. The district doesn't go away from that vote. So the, the school board is still the school board. Um, what this article, let me steal your article here. So the article is, shall the voters authorize the school board to petition the State Board of Education to regroup the Wyndham School District into different supervisory union pending the formulation and review of a needs assessment? So this is not stating that would even happen. This is the board asking you guys here to vote on whether or not you feel the board should should conduct this needs assessment. And if that needs assessment indicates that we would need to do a, um, possibly, you know, go to a different supervisory union, then we could, as the board, with that information, petition the Board of Ed that, ha that has that authority. The Board of Ed has the authority to regroup and, and make those decisions. So the information that would be gathered through that um, uh, review and needs assessment is what would dictate the, f the future action. So as far as what Bridget's saying and not voting on it today, that's incorrect. It's not a matter of, I can't give the specifics of the outcomes because we don't know the outcomes. This is just asking to do the needs assessment um, and get the information um, gathered, especially considering, sorry, it's my dog's medication I need to give her. Um, and so that's what that is for, is to allow us the opportunity to really dive into um, what, what changes could and should be done, uh, if anything, or are we, are we on track with what's best for the community? Hey, Bill, I see your hand. And I'll take the microphone to myself. Um, why can't the needs assessment be done without changing the supervisor union? The needs assessment is, is to get information regarding not only the current supervisory union that we're in, but um, like the uh, Bennington Rutland supervisory union, uh, Teutonic and Green School District, which is part of that same supervisory union. Um, oh, what's the other one? Is that Andover? Um, what's it called? Two Rivers, thank you, yes. Um, so that is, you know, something to be looking at as far as we, we need to be told by the voters to conduct this assessment because that may, may bring forward information that we need to act on. And we can't act on it without doing the assessments and the voters need to direct the board to do that. With the current status quo, is that right? Would be requesting from the different districts if we are voted by if the voters vote to instruct the board we are then following the electorate's you know ruling as far as we want this information so therefore the other supervisory unions are acting in response to that versus a school board just going hey we want to know you see the difference i'm not sure but go, that's okay <laughs> okay i see kate Wright's hand you're okay and then and then it, does the decision about whether to move to a different supervisory union come back to the voters? So I think the information from the assessments definitely would need to be coming back to the voters to say what's, you know, this is what we found um, and, and make decisions based on that information. Antal, I saw your hand. I feel like we have already dealt with this issue when that the school budget was sh turned down and the freedom of choice for where you go to school has already been dealt with. Therefore, I don't think we even need a school board to direct us what 
what bunch of people far away from us should choose to do with our school that they can't we don't have a school for them to direct so why should they even be involved yes al mclean okay i confess i'm confused did the board bring this article before the are you the one that brought the article out forward the board of education here in Wyndham? Article, yeah. yes and i'm confused why you did that and how in the world have you checked with the vermont state board of education on the likelihood feasibility of doing this have you checked with lawyers about what may be some implications of that and how in the world are you gonna have a pending formulation and review of needs assessment. Who's going to do that? How's it going to happen? Is it going to be for the community, for the parents? I, I'm just very confused. I don't understand this. So, yes, so the, the board would conduct the needs assessment. So we would obtain, it's a very thorough um, assessment and looking at budgets uh, from all the other supervisory unions um academics uh the financials buildings um opportunities for students so all of those things get brought into not only what potential outcomes there are to be a part of potent of another supervisory union what conflicts could that cause if we were to leave if there was you know that's also comes out is if there is there stuff that would happen that would harm us from leaving the current supervisory union um, I just, uh, I personally feel that this is a really great step considering where things are um, at with all of the change and that the more information we can gather and have is going to dictate much better decision making going forward because we need to know what's out there and what, um, and what can we share with the community. So it's really important. Okay. Yes, Bridget. Hi, um, I was just wondering if there's a cost associated with the assessment. Thank you. The answer is no. Okay, Michael. Um, I think it's first important for us to think about uh, where a needs assessment and potential petition to the Board of Ed could lead. Um, it could lead with us leaving our current supervisory union. Currently, we are part of the Leon and Gray district, which is where we send our kids to high school. We have an agreement with that high school that we will send our kids there. If folks truly want school choice, this would be the thing to do because if the board and the needs assessment find that it is appropriate and recommended that we move away from our current supervisory union, we would then have school choice for high school. Thanks. Sand. Fra Frank C. right here in the middle. All right, it's, I'm totally sorry. Uh, who's going to decide what the needs are and how will you quantify those? And uh, will you then come back to the voters and present your, your uh, stuff? But you, the school board will decide uh, what the needs are without asking for input from anyone else, no? The multiple surveys and all types of information getting from families. Um, it, multiple surveys and all, but one thing you uh, need to do uh, before you start anything like that is to uh, do your evaluation uh, uh, part first so you know how you're going to evaluate your data and know uh, uh, did you get what you needed or did you uh, need what you got uh, uh, before you start? So thank you. I see Russ's hand. Well, yeah, kind of like 
school choice is statewide for anyone in high school. School choice would apply for the uh, seventh and eighth graders if we were to try to expand it, but it's statewide, anyone can go to any school if they're accepted there. It's not, um, you know, limited. Okay. I, I see Ellen's hand, or Phil's. Yeah, um, on one hand, I heard that this was going to um, be um, an action by the school board to look at the possibility of looking for another supervisory union, but this article is actually stating to authorize you to petition it um, with or without, I guess, you know, whatever due diligence y'all care to put in it. But, I'm looking at this mainly from the standpoint these kids in this school have already been jolted pretty hard this year uh, and have been put to a brand new school and to me it seems a little bit premature to be looking for another supervisory union that may send the kids to Floodbrook or something because I know that as I was a kid every time I switched schools it was pretty traumatic and uh, I would like to just sort of see things start with what they've got going down in Townsend and um, see how that goes. And if there's issues, then we can look at whether this current supervisory union is what we want. Any other discussion on this article? See no other discussion. We're going to go into the vote. So Article 7, we're going to do a show of hands. Okay. Shall the voters authorize the school board to petition the State Board of Education to regroup Wyndham School District into a different supervisory union pending the formulation and review of a needs assessment? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. All those opposed, please raise your hand. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. Article 7 does not pass as written. And uh, that brings us to Article 8, to transact any other business that may legally come before this meeting. And this is the school board meeting, not the town meeting. We are going to go back into the town meeting, but I'm a mite peckish. <laughs> and I imagine that some other people might be as well. So um, if anybody has uh, Rachel okay so there's a there's been a motion from Rachel before we go into lunch that we disrupt the order of business and adjourn the school board meeting and move back into the town meeting and go into articles I'm sorry 21 through 23, or 21 and 22. Okay, okay, so that's up to the body. That's not my call, um, but there's a motion to change the order of business um, and needs a second and then needs a two thirds majority. Okay, I see Dan's hand. Okay, no discussion on changing the order of business. So that's a non-binding article, and part of what the, the motion is is to adjourn the town, uh, the school board meeting, and to go back into town meeting, okay? And that's the order of business, as I understand the motion. So now we, this requires a two-thirds vote, okay? Everybody understand what we're voting on. We're changing the order of business. We're going back into the town meeting, adjourning the school board meeting, and going to Article 21 and 22 before we adjourn for lunch, okay? All those in favor of doing that, raise your hand. Okay. Um, any opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Um, 
I'm calling it, that was a two-thirds majority, that we're going to disrupt the order of business and we're going to adjourn the school board meeting, go back into the town meeting, and go to Article 21. Okay? All right. So now we are back in the town meeting. And I would ask the uh, thank you, school board. Round of applause. <laughs> ask the select board to come back up to the platform. Um, point, point of order, Jerry, or? What, go ahead. What's your point of order? Yep, that's correct. We're, we're in that nebulous time period between dinner and supper. Yep, that's, that's the price of democracy, that's what I would say. Okay, so as the select board is, is coming back up and transitioning from the school board, we're gonna go into Article 21. I'll recognize you, Rachel. Do you have a point of order? Uh, so 21 is the um, uh, the constable being an elected, moving it from an elected to, um, and Article 22 is about Australian ballot for town officials. Right, yeah, so, um, but we voted on Article 21 and 22, I'm sorry, so. Okay. All right, Article 21. Shall the voters amend the position of constable from an elected position to a position appointed by the select board which will establish the qualifications, duties, and compensation of the constable position? Okay, looking for a motion from the floor. Okay. The Allie Cummings has moved the article as written. Need a second from the floor. Dan Riley, second. Okay. Article 21, shall the voters amend the position of constable from an elected position to a position appointed by the select board, which will establish the qualifications, duties, and compensation of the constable position? Any discussion? Yes, Bill. I'm just wondering what the, the rationale is for making a change. Simply oversight. Currently, the position has no official oversight it's, as it's an elected position. It's, um, there's nobody who can oversee or um, address any issues um, that might come up. Um, therefore, if it becomes an appointed position, they're effectively staff, and therefore the select board can address any issues make changes accordingly. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion, Kathy? Um, Bill's going to bring the microphone around. The select board doesn't have oversight on any other elected position. Why are you singling out this one position? Why would you want to have oversight over the constable, not the treasurer, not the town clerk, not the listers, why just the constable? The reason for that rationale, at least from my standpoint, is that um, the select board is um, actively utilizing the constable to achieve various tasks that currently aren't really um, necessarily part of that person's quote unquote job, and therefore, if we turn it into their job, and we had them have oversight to make sure that everything's copacetic. For instance, if we have, um, I don't know, challenges with uh, zoning, for instance, or something, we need somebody to go out to physically to meet with somebody and deliver paperwork or something like that, we can utilize the constable position to do that. We don't really have the oversight and authority at this point to do that. Rick Weitzel. I'm gonna wait for a microphone. Rick. There we go. 
why, why can't the sheriffs take that over? They're already getting paid to cover Wyndham. And why should that be part of the constable's job? Uh, serving papers, et cetera. Um, as much as I like Robert back there, we pay by the hour for the sheriff's department. So. Well, I'm sorry, Frank. How's that? All right. The, um, it's because we pay by the hour for the sheriff's department, and the constable uh, is a, a stipend position at this point. Well, the, the sheriffs are, are totally qualified and already paid. Are you going to pay for the constable to be trained and, and uh, et cetera? It seems like uh, the sheriffs could do the job quite well. They sure could, but again, they're, they're qualified, but every time we call them up, we have to pay by the hour. The constable is a stipend position that's a nominal fee for the, annually, and we can utilize them for various local things. Bozeman. Who is going to pay for the education to bring the constable up to par as opposed to the sheriffs, which are already there? We're, uh, and what would that cost? I, I, I guess we don't know that, but that's my question is that if uh, the sheriffs are pre-existing, it may be easier just to add that to their duties. And how many times do we need a constable to go and do that kind of work. Do you have any statistics on that? I don't have any. I can quote you off the top of my head, but I know the constable was very active this year and did a lot of, uh, made a lot of calls about various issues. And um, again, this is a little, we're a little bit out of order here because 20 had to do with that too. Article 20 had to do with uh, prohibiting the constable from exercising any law enforcement authority, which is, you know, the authority that requires all the training and expense that you're talking about. We haven't gone on Article 20 yet, have we? No, that's what I say. This is somehow we went a little bit out of order here. So we're talking about an issue that would have made more sense if we did Article 20 first. But well, maybe if we had stayed with a school budget and finished that and then went on to without keep switching everything, the confusion would be less. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't have any problem with that. It's just that the body voted to do it this way. Yeah, I'm just pointing that out. That's just an opinion. Thank no, you. No, that's fine. Okay, I see uh, Phil McDuffie's hand. Yeah, let me try to clear up a little bit of confusion about what the constable, as far as the state of Vermont, their duties. One of their duties is to serve papers from courts, summons, warrants, subpoenas. That's their job. Um, they're allowed to tras trespass on a person's property to deliver that but that does not require law enforcement training. If the constable felt like it was going to be dangerous because somebody had threatened him for him walking on their property, then he should by all means contact the sheriff's department and have them accompany him because the sheriff would be the trained law enforcement officer. So it's purely in the bailiwick of the constable to deliver summons if there's an issue with something going on with property that, you know, there's a stop work order and they want to stop it, then you need to get a, like a court order and the constable then would deliver that whatever the other order would be. Just hand it over, that's it. Thank you. Um, I see Tan Bronson's hand. I was just curious if there's a job description for what a constable does, because in the past it was been more of a dog warden, which was dangerous. You could get involved with cranky dogs. You were at the risk of trespassing if someone reported a dog locked up somewhere. Um, the, it just seems like a, a liability that we wouldn't want as a town to take on something that requires proper training. So I'm just a little nervous that we're expanding something that is, is logically a law, law, law enforcement job. Okay. 
I think the, the intention here is just the opposite. It was, you know, there's been conversation um, and concern expressed by various uh, residents about whether or not we were headed down the path of trying to set up a constable that had law enforcement authority. Like I said last year, that was all just a matter of speculation or consideration. We've never gone any further with that because getting a constable trained to be a law enforcement officer like uh, Robert Lakin is, is a very expensive and time consuming thing. So it's, that's, not, that's not the intention of what we were talking about and that's not the way the constable has been utilized. Um, so far they've been a, um, a liaison, so to speak, between the select board and the sheriff's department or even in an attempt to, to communicate with the state police which has limited, uh, has had limited success, but it's not the intention of either of those articles to give the constable more authority, it's just to clarify what we want the constable to do. And the issue of, you know, there are statutory responsibilities, you asked about a job description, and like, like uh, Phil said, constables do have statutory um, authority based on what level they are. Uh, so, you know, there is a definition already of what they can and can't do. And all we're trying to do is clarify that. Okay, any other discussion on Article 21? Seeing no other discussion, we'll move to a vote. Article 21, shall the voters amend the position of constable from an elected position to a position appointed by the select board which will establish the qualifications, duties, and compensation of the constable position? Okay, everybody understands we're voting on the article. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Oh, I, yeah, I turned the volume off. Hold on. We had two yes votes and one nay. Okay. Um, it appears the ayes have it. Uh, the ayes do have it. Article 21 passes as written. Okay. Article 22. Shall the town of Wyndham adopt Australian balloting 17 VSA section 2680 for the election of town officers in special elections except in cases where a floor vote is mandated by Vermont statute? Looking for a motion from the floor. See Bill Casey's hand moving the article. I need a second, Rachel Spangler. Okay, uh, any discussion on Article 22? Oh, okay, um, is, that, is that Vance downstairs? Okay. No. Okay, um, Nancy, I saw your hand. Um, the reason I think that it would be a good idea is that it would enable, I think the reason I think it would be a good idea for us to have Australian ballot for the election of officers is that it would give us the opportunity to allow something like a candidate's night where people could, could speak and tell you what their ideas were. And if we don't do it, we wind up like this, where like I only had two minutes to tell you of all of my qualifications. Whereas if it had been possible for there to have been an Australian ballot, we could have had a candidate's night, maybe had other people who were interested in running for that position, and we could have actually maybe had a discussion. So that's why it, on the surface of it, looks to me like a really good idea. Okay, any other, any other discussion? Yes, Becky. Hi, um, I really respect the value of town meeting and being an in-person event. I also think that it's important to recognize when we had COVID and people had to use Australian ballot, we had a much higher voter turnout. I think that we can still reap the benefits of having an in-person town meeting by having a pre-event, like an informational day where people can still have the discussion and discourse while enabling more members of the town to vote. As we can see, you know, there are downsides to uh, a lengthy 
process where now you know some voters have left because they don't have the ability to stay here all day. So having an Australian ballot would enable more uh, voters in the town to participate in the democratic process. Yes, uh, Dan. Ballot on all major decisions. It makes it it makes it a democracy, rather than just have a minority that shows up and votes what they want. So. Australian ballot is the way we should do and run our town. Just, just to be clear, this article is not for Australian ballot for all articles. It's just for elected positions. So officers of the town, just to be clear. And special elections. Special elections for officers. So the statute is very clear what Australian ballot can and cannot do. And uh, if you read the statute, um, the language in this article is for town officers, and then it would be for special elections of town officers. So that's my understanding, and I did have a discussion with the town attorney. So this is not for all articles. This is only for town officers. Okay. Phil. Well, yeah, I hope that um, most of you read the long letter that I sent out. Um, hmm? Oh, that you read the letter I sent out concerning um, both the constable and uh, uh, which was Article 20 that we haven't voted on, but the Australian ballot. Uh, as Mike says, this, this pertains only to the election of officers. This still preserves town meeting as far as um, coming together and having the discussions we had on major issues. Um, and, um, but it keeps, you know, it does limit some of the paper balloting that we do on contested elections. Um, so, and I fully agree that when we have the ability to conduct Australian balloting, we have the proof that, you know, the voting rates percentage of participation of people, especially those over 60, is greatly enhanced. And, you know, a lot of these people today that are here have, were very impassioned about what happened earlier. And I don't think they would have ordinarily been here to this meeting. So this at least gives everybody in this town an ability to at least elect the, the officers of the town. Okay, I see Collins, Collins' hand down front. Uh, I just wanted to know, Mike, if you, if you knew when it said except by, you know, except, except by statute, you know, Vermont statutes, w w you know, what exceptions do you know which officers are, are not allowed to be voted on by Australian ballot. That's just my curiosity on that one. I just, is it, is it clearly stated or, or is that something you have to check with the Secretary of State about? I think we'd have to look at the statute. I, I have not committed the language to memory. That's but, okay. I just but figured if you knew. Well, my I, understanding was it was for just for officers, okay. just carte blanche. So okay. uh, that's my understanding. Thank you. But I, I, could be, I could be incorrect. Any other discussion on Article 22? Ellen. It's my understanding that um, what that means is that there are certain things that Vermont statute says have to be voted. If you're a floor vote uh, town, that you have to vote by floor vote. And one of those is voting for Australian ballot. So that's why that's in there. Okay. Any other discussion on Article 22? Okay. Seeing no other discussion, we're going to move into the voting portion of Article 22. Shall the town of Wyndham adopt Australian balloting 17 VSA Section 2680 
for the election of town officers and special elections, except in cases where a floor vote is mandated by Vermont statute. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna ask all those in favor to stand up. And, and so for people in the back row who are standing and are not in favor of this article, please find a seat, because I think that's gonna be easier to count than hands. All those in favor, please rise. Okay, how many do you have downstairs, Maureen? Seven. Okay, I counted 61 up here. Okay, please be seated. All those opposed to Article 22, please rise. Okay, please be seated. We have one downstairs, though. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the eyes appear to have it. The eyes do have it. Article 2 passes as written. And so, so just to be clear, that doesn't start until the next town meeting. Um, so just so we're all clear, I, I would entertain a motion to adjourn because I am hungry. <laughs> Not adjourn, sorry. Um, thank you. Reese, thank you, Carolyn. I get my words confused. Um, Kathy Youngerman makes a motion to recess. Pat McLean seconded. All those in favor for recess for lunch downstairs, say aye. aye. Okay, so um, people who brought food are welcome to join downstairs. There's also uh, deviled eggs and a number of different items for everyone's delectation. Okay, enjoy. Thank you. All right, so we're going back into town meeting. Uh, we're going to go to Article 2. Shall the voters accept the town report prepared by the auditors? The motion on the floor and move the article as written from Carolyn, seconded from Joseph Monroe. Okay, um, Article 2, shall the voters accept the town report prepared by the auditors? Any discussion? Yes, George. Okay, so um, what I propose for changing the number on Article 7 is that the select board make an, uh, uh, an amendment to that article when we get there. Okay, yep. Okay. Um, any other discussion on Article 2? See? Yes. I would just like the body here to be able to understand how much hard work the auditors put into it and how often they're done. Okay. So, yep, yeah, I'll repeat the comments. So, the, the comment was that the auditors, auditors had a lot of work invested in this, and um, um, thanks to the auditors, and, and I second that. Um, okay, so Article 2 has been motioned and, and um, seconded. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing no discussion, uh, we'll move to the vote. Uh, Article 2, shall the voters accept the town report prepared by the auditors? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say aye. nay. Okay, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 2 passes. Article 3 to elect all town officers as required by law. So uh, we'll start with the select person, unless people want to change the order of the meeting. That was a joke, okay. Um, it was a good joke. Yes, it was. Okay, so um, select person, uh, this is George's, George's position. Uh, so looking for nominations from the floor. Antia. Okay, there's a nomination for George for selectman. Uh, seconded, Kathy. It's, it's a lot of support. Any other nominations from the floor? Looking for a motion. I move that the nominations be closed and the clerk cast one ballot be closed. Okay, there's a motion from the floor that the nominations be closed and the clerk cast one ballot for George Dutton. Second. Been seconded by Colin. Okay, all those in favor of George for select person, say aye. Aye. And aye. Any opposed, say nay. 
The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. George, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, the next position is for Lister. That's a three-year term. Uh, I believe that's, is that Russ's position? Is that, is that the right one? Okay. Okay, so looking for nominations from the floor. Michael. I nominate Okay, there's a nomination for Antia Rupert. Any other nominations? Okay, there's a nomination for Frank C. Wright. Okay, any other nominations? Okay, this is for Lister, three-year term. Okay, any other nominations from the floor? Okay, seeing no other nominations, we'll go into a the vote portion of this. So, all right, I guess we'll do it by a show of hands since the body is greatly minimized. Um, absolutely, I'll repeat the nominees. So this is for Lister, the position of Lister, and Antia Rupert has been nominated and Frank C. Wright has also been nominated, okay? And we'll do it by show of hands. Um, unless, Antia, do you wanna, do you wanna say something? You have the right. Um, sure if you wanna speak to your candidacy. Thank you. Um, thank you for the nomination, Michael. I am very interested in finding out more of the workings of a town or the community of Wyndham. I've been helping with the uh, planning commission and I sent in for a Mac recently to do the minutes of the select board and um, so, I'm sorry? Oh, anyway, I would love to give that my best shot and I want to pledge that I will do um, this or will fulfill my role with decency and respect. That is very important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Antia. Okay, I think Frank has gone home. So um, by show of hands, um, for Antia Rupert, all those in favor of Antia, please raise your hands. Okay, and okay, and all those in favor of Frank C. Wright, please raise your hand. Any downstairs, Maureen? No zero. Okay, so um, Antia appears to have it. Antia does have it. Thank you. And also thank you to Russ for serving in that capacity. We talk about town offices being thankless. Thank you. Okay, um, looking for uh, an auditor and, um, I, I, I'm sorry, this is for um, Kathy Youngerman's seat. Um, so looking for nominations from the floor, Ellen? Okay. Okay. Maureen? I'd like to nominate Kathy Youngerman. Okay. Yep. Okay. So Kathy Youngerman's been nominated. Okay. Um, any other nominations for auditor? Okay. Seeing no other nominations. Walter is better at that. <laughs> Okay, so there's a motion that the nominations be closed and the clerk cast one ballot for Kathy Youngerman. I need a second. It's been seconded, Pat McLean. All those in favor of Kathy Youngerman as auditor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Kathy, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, so the next position is constable. Um, so vote held until after Article 21. Article 21 
passed. So my understanding is that the constable is no longer an elected position. Is that correct? So we're not going to vote on constable at this town meeting. Is that correct? Okay. Everybody understand that? Okay. The next position is delinquent tax collector. Um, so uh, I think Paul. It, okay, Paul Wyman's the incumbent. There's a nomination for Paul. Any other nominations from the floor? Okay, there's a motion on the floor that the nominations be closed and the clerk casts one ballot for Paul Wyman. Need a second, Pete. Okay, all those in favor of Paul Wyman as delinquent tax collector, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. I know Paul's not here, but please express his gratitude for, for all, from all of us. Okay, um, the next position is a commissioner for the Wyndham Center Cemetery Commission. Um, and uh, Walt is up for, his position is up, so looking for nominations from the floor. Carolyn. I nominate Paul Woodruff. Okay. Um, any other nominations for this position? Who was that for, please, Michael? That's for Walter Woodruff. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other nominations from the floor? Let's see if I can pull Walt Okay. Okay, that's uh, really close. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a motion on the floor that the nominations be closed and the clerk cast one ballot for Walt. Um, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed aye. say nay. Okay, uh, Walter, thank you very much. Okay, the next position is for the West Wyndham Cemetery Commissioner. Um, current, uh, currently, that's held by Colin. Uh, so, looking for nominations from the floor. Michael. Okay, there's a nomination for Colin Blage. Um, any other nominations from the floor? Carolyn. Colin. <laughs> okay. There's a motion on the floor uh, that the nominations be closed and the clerk cast one ballot for Colin. That needs a second. Dion seconded. Okay. All those in favor of Colin as, uh, it's a little premature, don't you think? Yeah, just wait one second. Okay. All those in favor of Colin as West Woodham Cemetery Commissioner say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, all right, now you can sign, Colin. All right. Okay, for this next article, I've been informed that we're actually going to vote on two positions. Okay, uh, Carol? North Wyndham, yeah, this is the. I'm sorry? North, no, we're on the North, North Wyndham Cemetery Commission. Okay, well. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's probably true that we can't. We you know, there's two positions. So how does that usually ha happen when a commissioner resigns? Is the select board appoint? Okay, so you'll appoint. You can unless you have an election. You can vote somebody in. Right, but because it wasn't warned, I think that I think Ellen's got a point that we can't vote for because it's only one position until the next time. Yeah, so you guys can appoint somebody to serve until next town meeting, and then we'll have two. My understanding is that Carol resigned before this town meeting. Right, so the, but it wasn't warned. That's the question, is it didn't get warned on the town meeting, so we can't vote on it. Okay. Is there any interest in that position, though, in the room? Yeah, there is. It would be great to know the list of people interested. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bobby's going to take that position. Um, Right, but but the only it's not for five years. It would be for the remainder of his term of uh, Carol's term. Excuse me. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, uh, North Wyndham Cemetery Commission, and um, sorry, uh, this this is Ralph's Ralph Wyman's position. So looking for nominations from the floor. This is a five-year position. 
Okay, there's a nomination for Ralph. Duly noted. Uh, any other nominations for North Windham Cemetery Commissioner? Okay, so there's a motion from the floor that the nominations be closed and the clerk casts one ballot for Ralph Wyman. Needs a second. Okay, seconded by Michael Pelton. Okay, all those in favor of Ralph Wyman as North Wyndham Cemetery Commissioner, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, aye. say nay. Okay, um, so you can tell Ralph he was reelected. Thank you. Um, the next position is uh, for library trustee, and uh, this is for uh, Eileen Widger's position. So looking for nominations from the floor. I'd like to nominate Eileen Widger. Okay, there's a nomination. Okay. Any other nominations for library trustee? Okay. There's a motion that the nominations be closed and the clerk cast one ballot for Eileen Widger. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed aye. say nay. The ayes appear to have it. Um, Eileen, congratulations, you've been reelected. Okay. Okay, moving on to Article 4. Shall the voters authorize the town treasurer to collect current taxes? The motion from Antia to move the article as written. It's been seconded by Carolyn. Uh, any discussion on Article 4? Seeing no discussion, we'll move into the voting portion. Shall the voters authorize the town treasurer to collect current taxes? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Uh, article 4 passes as written. Article 5, shall the voters set the due date for property taxes as postmarked on or before October 31st, 2024? So moved. so moved by Carolyn Partridge, seconded by Pat McLean. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, we'll move into the voting portion. Shall the voters set the due date for property taxes as postmarked on or before October 31st, 2024? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed aye. say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 5 passes as written. Article 6. Shall the voters authorize $339,107 for the general fund, of which $281,252 shall be raised by taxes, and $57,855 shall be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus. Voted in 2023, 257,488 raised from taxes. Looking for a motion from the floor. Antia. Okay. Antia, seconded by Carolyn. Did you get that, Mac? Okay. Um, so, the article has been moved. Any discussion? Phil. We have discussion down here. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll recognize that person in just a moment, please. Um, do we have a microphone? Because there are still people downstairs. Yeah, it's Phil McDuffie. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody how to vote on this or recommend it because to be honest I haven't gone through the detailed budget but I have just looked at the articles that have been proposed this year and I just want people to be aware that um, I think the 24 percent 20 24 percent tax increase that's going to be passed on to us is, is listed as 19 percent um, but the truth is our budget has increased 43% this year. And that is being offset by what I ran up in my spreadsheet, and this is just on the line items in the articles, and it's not looking through the budget, but that we're applying about close to a quarter of a million dollars of 2023 surplus 
to pay for this budget. So I've looked back through several years and I've never seen a number that large for, um, you know, as a, as a uh, budget surplus from the previous year. Usually it's on the order of about $30,000. And so something's changed. I don't know exactly what has changed. I'm, it, it may be, you know, it's the money that we had on January the 1st. I don't know, you know, that was in general funds. But, you know, a lot of these are very are restricted funds. So I'm presuming that, you know, in this particular one, this is, you know, not, you know, I, when I look at a quarter million dollars, I realize it's both you know, in restricted accounts and in the, the general account. But I'm just uh, concerned, I guess, one, from a potential cash flow, because, you know, in sep October, we have a big influx of money from taxes, and it starts decreasing from that point on until the following October. But, you know, the budget we're proposing today is for this year. and. You know, if if we're usually if we were depending on any of these funds that were quote left over in January to help cover us over the lean months of say August September, I would hate to see that dry up. So there's just something that's very different this year about this budget, um, and you know, if we've increased it 43 percent this year, you know, are we going to have a, a a sizable budget surplus next year to help cover, you know, our increase for next year. As I said, I've never seen a surplus like this. So we've either changed accounting methods or something's different. So, and I see our treasurer's got her hand up. I'll give her. Thank you. There are a couple of reasons why uh, the surplus, for example, if you look on page 32, um, $35,000 of that surplus was a sale of property um, that the property was a tax sale property that was purchased. And the town cannot make a profit on something. So they have to give it back to the taxpayers. So that $35,000 that was used by somebody who bought that property, they gave it to the town, gave it back to the taxpayers by taking it off the general fund. So that's why the surplus is so large. It may not be that large um, next year, unless we have a, another situation. As to the budget being up, um, if you look at line 127 on page 32, you will see $25,000 in legal expenses. Now, that's a fact. What's not a fact, and is my opinion, is we're being sued every time we turn around. You need to know that. The town has been sued. I don't know what's going to happen with those lawsuits, but they are running up significant legal expense. So that's a, a big change. Michael, we have some comments down here. Okay. Uh, hi, I wanted to make a motion to uh, give a raise to the select board. Uh, do you have a dollar figure in mind, Kermit? Add a thousand dollars to what they're already making they do a, a lot of work and it's obviously <laughs> unloved job <laughs> okay so you're proposing a thousand dollars total or a thousand dollars per select board member per. okay so there's there's a motion for an amendment to this general fund budget number to increase it by three thousand dollars Okay, so there's a motion for an amendment. Amendment needs a second and a majority vote. So looking for a second on that amendment. 
Okay, it's been seconded. Okay, so now um, we're going to vote on the amendment to the article. Um, any discussion on that amendment? Before you do that, can you tell me who seconded it, please? Uh, that was Colin. Thank you. Okay, uh, any discussion? Bill. Station two. What what would that bring their compensation to? Uh, that would be three thousand five hundred dollars per select board member. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other discussion on this amendment? Okay. Now we're voting. We're going to vote on the amendment to the article. So the article is going to then read: Shall the voters authorize? $342,107 for the general fund, of which 284252 shall be raised by taxes, and 57855 shall be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus. Is that right, Kathy? Okay. All right, so we're voting on the amendment to the article, not the article itself. All those in favor of amending the article as proposed, say aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. So we're going to go back into the, the, the article itself, which has now been amended. Any other discussion on the amended article? George. Yeah, I just wanted to also point out that the uh, fire company requested uh, more funds this year. And that's something that we felt was um, just, but it is a large chunk of money. So. Okay. Any other discussion on Article 6 as amended? Okay, see no other discussion. Article 6, show, Ellen, you, do you have a comment? Yeah, we need a microphone. Oh, okay. Um, my question is, Kathy explained 35,000 surplus, but it's like almost 225,000 surplus that's going into the budget this year. And I'm just wondering, you know, where, why do we have such a surplus in the first place? Um, are we being overtaxed uh, would be a question. <laughs> but, if, you know, I, I just don't quite understand it. We've never used that much surplus money in the budget before, to my knowledge. Are we dealing with Article 6, We're dealing with Article 6, correct. Okay. Okay, so we're going to discuss the surplus in each article? No. Right, we can only discuss each article as it comes up, so... Um, your point is taken. Um, any other discussion on the amended article? Joyce. The question is, is the surplus note noted anywhere in the budget? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, it hasn't. It's on uh, page 32. The surplus is described in line um, 129 and 130. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion on the article as amended? Seeing no other discussion, Article 6. Shall the voters authorize $342,107 for the general fund, of which $284,252 shall be raised by taxes and $57,855 shall be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. 
The ayes do have it. Article 6 passes as amended. Okay. Um, article 7, and I know there's going to be an amendment to this article. Just give everybody a heads up. Shall the voters authorize roads budgets, roads budget expenditures of $536,286, of which $520,953 shall be raised by taxes, and $15,333 shall be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus, voted in 2023, $506,580, of which $476,603 was raised by taxes, and $30,375 was applied from fiscal year 2022 budget surplus. Looking for a motion, and uh, I think the select board wanted to make a, make a motion. Yeah, I've got a motion here to uh, amend the numbers presented in Article 7. Okay. The uh, first number for expenditures is going to be amended to $537,286. Okay. Of which $520,900. Oh, I was reading, yeah. Oh, 521, 953 shall be raised by taxes. Okay. So there's a, a motion to amend the article. Uh, and my understanding, this was a typographical error. It should have been included in the, the warning, but we can't just change it. We have to amend the article as written. So there's a, a motion to amend the article to increase that by $1,000. Uh, looking for a second on that amendment. Kathy Youngerman seconded. Any discussion? Don't think this merits much discussion. Um, so we're going to vote on the amendment to the article before we vote on the article itself. Um, shall the voters? Uh, this is we're going to change the amount of the the budget from 536 286 to 537 286. Uh, all those in favor of amending the article thusly say aye. Any, any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 7 as amended, has been amended. Uh, any other discussion on Article 7 as amended? Pete? So there's a comment um, uh, complimenting the road crew because they're doing a fantastic job, and I, I concur. Um, yep. Pete, thanks for the comment, and, and I wish Richard was here because I'd like to embarrass him publicly. He would, he would hate this, and, and he probably escaped for that reason, but he really is. Um, we couldn't ask for a better foreman in particular, and, and uh, Kurt's a great uh, <clears throat> road crew member, but we are really fortunate to have a, an excellent road crew. So whenever you do have the opportunity, I'll make sure I pass on the comments here, but whenever you do have the opportunity to let him know personally, I. He'll be embarrassed in particular, but it's worthwhile because I think it really does mean something to him. Thanks. Bren. Good. Could you summarize what Ren said? We couldn't hear her. Road crew, good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, seeing no other discussion, we're going to vote on the article as amended. Article 7, shall the voters authorize roads budget expenditures of $537,286 of which $521,953 shall be raised by taxes and $15,333 shall be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 7 passes as amended. Okay, Article 8. 
Shall the voters appropriate $180,703 for the new road machinery fund, of which $72,000 shall be raised by taxes, and $108,703 will be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus, voted in 2023, $35,000. Looking for a motion from the floor. Colin moves the article as written. Any other? I need a, a second to bring the article. Okay, Dion seconded. Okay, so uh, any discussion on Article 8 as written? Okay, seeing no discussion. Article 8, shall the voters appropriate $180,703 for the new road machinery fund, of which $72,000 shall be raised by taxes, and $108,703 will be applied from fiscal year 2023 budget surplus. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 8 passes as written. Article 9. Shall the voters appropriate $50,000 for repaving and $10,000 for bridges and large structures? Voted 2023, $30,000 for repaving and no new funds for bridges and large structures. Looking for a motion from the floor. John Hoover moves the article as written. David? It's been seconded by David. Any discussion on Article 9? Who is that, David Hoover? David Cherry. Thank you. Okay, seeing no discussion, we're going to move into the voting. Article 9, should the voters appropriate $50,000 for repaving and $10,000 for bridges and large structures? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any, aye. any opposed say nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 9 passes as written. Article 10. Shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the Town Garage Maintenance and Improvement Fund, voted in 2023, $10,000? Looking for a motion from the floor. Kathy, moves the article. Kathy Scott moves the article as written. Bill? Seconded by Bill Dunkel. Any discussion on Article 10? Seeing no discussion. Article 10, shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the Town Garage Maintenance and Improvement Fund? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any aye. opposed say nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 10 passes as written. Article 11, shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the Town Office Maintenance and Improvement Fund? Voted in 2023, no new funds were voted Town Office M&I. Looking for a motion from the floor. Kathy, I recognize Kathy. Kathy makes a motion to move the article as written. Michael, did you? Seconded by Michael Simons. Any discussion on Article 11? See no discussion. Article 11, shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the Town Office Maintenance and Improvement Fund? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 11 passes as written. Article 12. Shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the Meeting House Maintenance and Improvement Fund? Voted in 2023, $10,000. Moved by Kathy Youngerman. Seconded by Joyce. And any discussion? Okay, seeing no discussion, Article 12, shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the Meeting House Maintenance and Improvement Fund? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 12 passes as written. Article 13, shall the voters close the weatherization fund and move the $5,719 in that fund to the Meeting House M&I Fund? And just to clarify, that's maintenance and improvement for weatherization in that building. Looking for a motion from the floor. Kathy? Kathy Scott moves the article as written. Bill? Seconded by Bill Dunkel. Any discussion? Yes. Paul Stapleton. 
Um, Bill's going to bring a microphone for you. Uh, I, I just w wasn't sure what the, the current weatherization fund, was that for other buildings or was that just for this building? Bill can answer that. Yeah, I can explain. This was money that was uh, given to the Energy Committee years ago to be used for weatherization of any particular building in town. But uh, there's a big need to have this building in particular weatherized now, so it makes sense to transfer the money over into the, into the meeting house fund. Okay. Any other discussion on this article? Seeing no other discussion, move to the voting portion. Shall the voters close the weatherization fund and move the $5,719 in that fund to the meeting house M&I uh, maintenance and improvement fund for weatherization in that building? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 13 passes as written. Article 14, shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the town-wide reappraisal of properties? Voted in 2023, $10,000. Looking for a motion from the floor. Al. Uh, the, the article has to be moved before we can talk about it. Okay, uh, moved by John Hoover, Russ. Seconded. Um, discussion. Yes. Thank you. How do we come up with a sum of ten thousand dollars? And it seems like that might not be a real, realistic sum for a townwide reappraisal of properties. Wondering how we come up with that number. Okay. Anybody have an answer for that, Russ? Reappraisal. And it, it comes from the state every year for reappraisal, and Kathy has an account that she keeps for the reappraisal fund. This is simply supplementing it um, to make sure there is enough if there's another reappraisal within the next five years. Okay. Any other discussion on Article 14? Seeing no other discussion. Article 14, shall the voters appropriate $10,000 for the town-wide reappraisal of properties? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any, aye. any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 14 passes as written. Article 15, shall the voters transfer $20,000 from 2023 surplus funds to be used for the NEMRIC Fund for Accounting Software and Services? Voted in 2023, $5,000. Looking for a motion from the floor. Paul Stapleton moves the article as written. And David? Second. It's been seconded by David Cherry. Any discussion? Yes. George. Um, once this new accounting system has been implemented, it seems like this fee is not going to be as high in the future. So we shouldn't expect that number in the future. Okay. Thank you, George. Any other discussion on this article? Seeing no other discussion, Article 15, shall the voters transfer $20,000 from 2023 surplus funds to be used for the NEMRIC Fund for Accounting Software and Services? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed aye. say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 15 passes as written. Article 16. Shall the voters transfer $16,000 from 2023 surplus funds to be used for a professional audit of Wyndham financial accounts? Voted in 2023, no funds were voted for a professional audit. Looking for a motion from the floor. Uh, uh, Pat McLean moves the article. Uh, looking for a second. Seconded by Joyce. Uh, any discussion on Article 16? Russ. The, the question is whether there are any funds budgeted already for an audit or if this is the only amount. Do we, does anybody know the answer to that question? I'm sorry? We have $4,500 currently for, a re, for, for an audit, okay. Yes, page 36 uh, shows that line item. 
in the account. Yes, Pat. Town. S speak into the mic. The, okay, sorry. The last external audit was done 12 years ago, and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns recommends an external audit every three years. So we feel it's, it's really important to have an audit, and in, in addition, our treasurer will be, has one more year, uh, so it's a good time to do an audit before a new person comes in. And we have the new software. So there ha has been a lot of change in the last year. So we think it's a good idea. The auditors think it's a good idea. Okay, any other discussion? Russ, uh, here's a microphone. I'd like to make the audit time sensitive and have it completed within this calendar year. Uh, understood. I don't think we can change the article because that's not something that was warned. So okay. we can we can advise that under other business, which is the last article of town meeting. Um, you know, as, as an advisory vote, we can do some sort of a straw poll or something like that, Thank but you. can't change the article as written. Yes, Kathy. Um, So Kathy's comment is that uh, they're already in discussions with a professional auditing company and expect to have some uh, firm deadline uh, at the end of spring. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on this article? Seeing no discussion, article 16. Shall the voters transfer $16,000 from 2023 surplus funds to be used for a professional audit of Wyndham Financial Accounts. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear. Okay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 16 passes as written. <clears throat> Article 17. Shall the voters change the name of the rainy day account to the emergency reserve fund? Looking for a motion from the floor. Kathy. Okay. The article has been moved. Joseph, seconded. Okay. Uh, it's been seconded by Joseph Monroe. Any discussion on 17? Seeing no discussion, Article 17, shall the voters change the name of the rainy day account to the emergency reserve fund? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 17 passes as written. Article 18, shall the voters transfer $25,000 from 2023 surplus funds into the emergency reserve fund? It says rainy day account, but I made that change. Um, voted in 2023, no funds were voted for the rainy day account. Looking for a motion from the floor. Uh, it's been moved by Pat McLean, seconded by Kathy Youngerman. Um, Article 18, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, Article 18, shall the voters transfer $25,000 from 2023 surplus funds into the rainy day account slash emergency reserve fund? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 18 passes as written. Article 19. Shall the voters appropriate $8,535 for the following nonprofit organizations as recommended by the Wyndham Social Services Committee to be distributed as indicated? And then we've got a, a list um, which everybody can read. I don't think anybody needs me to read all of these. Um, I'd be happy to do so, but um, okay. Uh, the article has to be moved before we can have discussion. Right. The article is moved, seconded, Bye. Barbara Jean, um, and now discussion. George? Yeah, I want to thank the Social Services Committee for putting this together. Um, there's one number on here that was added by the select board, and that's the uh, Brattleboro Development Credit Corp, or I believe that's it. 
and um, it's seven hundred and fifty dollars. They helped us um, with a lot of work to do with MERP and then other grants to benefit the meeting house. So, okay. I know Nikki Wengard from Neighborhood Connections was here earlier and uh, didn't have an opportunity to ask her to speak, but um, Neighborhood Connections is uh, it's a good organization. I can say that in an unbiased way. Any other discussion on this article? Seeing no other discussion, Article 19, shall the voters appropriate $8,535 for the following nonprofit organizations as recommended by the Wyndham Social Services Committee to be distributed as indicated. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed aye. say nay. Ayes appear to have it. Ayes do have it. Article 19 passes as written. Okay. <clears throat> Barbara Jean, thanks for being willing to talk if we needed you. So, But thanks for all the work, too. And if you'll pass that on, like George said, to the rest of the committee, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Article 20. <clears throat> Shall Wyndham prohibit the Constable of Wyndham from exercise any law, exercising any law enforcement authority? References to 24 VSA section 1936A. Looking for a motion from the floor. This motion's been moved by Russ Cumming. Looking for a second. Seconded by Dan Riley. Any discussion on Article 20? Barbara Jean. I have a question. If we vote to prohibit the constable from exercising law enforcement authority, that means he must go for training? I'm, I'm confused on what, what, because it's now in a point of position, which is a whole nother, how, how does that person get appointed? What qualifies them? I mean, it just opens up a whole can of who can do this job and what do they need to do to do this job. Are we saying you can handle dog situations, but you are not authorized to get in the middle of a domestic? Because being answering domestic calls is a whole other conversation. You need trained, experienced law enforcement officers because that is one of the most dangerous situations that law enforcement responds to. So if we're voting, no, you cannot have those kind of responsibilities to that person who are now we are now appointing am i understanding that correctly yeah i i would say uh phil did you put this petition together this is a petitioned article this wasn't something that we brought to the table I'm not saying i disagree with it but it's uh let's let the petitioners talk about it um so you know this addresses two things in my mind um one is um if we have a constable, well, let me go back. If we have a constable who is carrying a sidearm in the performance of their duties, it becomes very, well, you know, is, it, is he trying to do law enforcement or, or you know, catch a dog or something, that type of thing. Um, the, there is a risk you know, uh, 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 basically financial risk to the town that if the constable who is not trained as a law enforcement officer uses his gun during his duties, is the town potentially liable? Because he has a right as an individual to carry a gun. The question is, is he carrying it as an individual for his own self-protection or is he carrying it, you know, uh, to, I guess, make a statement that he's got authority or something. Uh, so what this thing, is, what this article is trying to do is, you know, to tell basically the select board, and this answers part of your question, that no, we don't want our constable to do any law enforcement activity and basically they can't go train him to go do any because this is much of a statement 
not only to the state that no, we don't want a constable, you know, doing law enforcement, we, you know, certainly not issuing tickets, and he can't issue tickets unless he is a certified law enforcement officer, which, as we've alluded to, goes into a lot of training, vetting from another police department, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a big monetary outlay of money that I don't think this town is <laughs> prepared to, to go down that route. So it's, it's twofold. One is to try to get some, you know, indemnity in case there is an accident, you know, because the state has recognized this is an issue. There are municipalities that have constables that are not law enforcement officers trained at all that are carrying guns, and they all face a risk if that gun is ever used in a transaction with anybody for any reason, you know, the question will come down, did he step out of his lane of authority as a constable when he used the gun? If he did, our insurance goes away, and we as a town are, are faced, you know, with, you know, a, long, a, law, a wrongful death or a wrongful injury lawsuit, and we all know how those things <laughs> tend to mushroom. So, so there's that part, and then there's part, it's telling the select board, no, we're not going to allow, you know, this constable to do law enforcement type activities. Yes, he can go and serve a summons. That's, that's one of the things that's given to him, you know, by the state. You know, he, he serves summons, any kind of court orders, things like that, subpoenas. Parking, he, parking tickets. We have to have an ordinance for parking tickets. I understand, so he can do that. <laughs> if he has he cannot tickets. arrest a person, you know, you can't, you, you know, you can't give a ticket, you know, for a moving violation. That's in a, a form of an arrest, so he can't do that. So, um, you know, basically it's, you know, he's got these duties, you know, serving, um, you know, court papers, um, helping the um, health officer, which and part of that goes with the, you know, the uh, dog licenses and all of that. Um, removing animals from the road, you know, dispatching of an animal that may be injured, you know. There's a number of things that are listed that I consider useful functions, and that's why I didn't want to just eliminate the position because they'd have to do it themselves or find somebody to go do those things when called upon. But what this thing is really trying to say is, no, we, you know, you're exactly right. Any domestic situation, that's something a law enforcement officer needs to deal with because they're trained for it. And we're not providing training for this person, you know. We're, you know, they're gonna help out in doing stuff that, you know, maybe other people just don't want to do or have the time to do. And so it's kind of a twofold thing. Try to get a little bit of indemnification for the town and, you know, tell the select board, no, we don't want our constable issuing tickets, you know, and there's gray areas, you know, that, you know, we got to watch for. I, I heard that the constables had flashing blue lights on a vehicle that, you know, I think it was to help slow down traffic somewhere, but any time a vehicle has any kind of flashing light requires a permit from the Department of Transportation. And I'm pretty sure the Department of Transportation will not issue a a non-law uh, non enforcement constable, one who's not certified with flashing blue lights, because in this state, flashing blue lights indicates that you're a law enforcement officer or vehicle. And so then you get this confusion, right? <laughs> you know, gee, am I, you know, could he pull me over? And that's, I'm, you know, so I'm hoping this is gonna make it straight that, you know, I don't mind him slowing traffic down, but I'd like him to have the correct lights, the correct ones, and have a permit to do so. And, and, and not just do it, you know. And so giving the power, and we've already given it to them to point, well, I'm gonna hold it to them to, to, to keep things, you know, completely, you know, uh, copacetic, if, we, if you will, okay? Okay, one second, Barbara Jean. Kathy, did you have a comment? Okay, yeah, um, Bill's gonna bring the microphone over. 
Um, it seems to me that with the appointment of the position, maybe a better description and definition of all duties and assignments, because I wouldn't be comfortable, I don't know um, what the exact definition of law enforcement authority is. It would seem to me that delivering summons was law enforcement, I don't know. So maybe it's not, but it seems like well, in the appointment, a really good job description with clearly defined tasks and expectations would be a good next step. Thank you. Barbara Jean. How would this appointment process work now that we're doing this? Do we define how we're going to proceed with that? Is it going to be in, like a civil service situation? We, we haven't gotten to that point yet. We weren't sure whether the article was going to pass. It was a concept that actually Michael recommended or suggested, and uh, we wanted to see what happened. So we'll have to discuss that at a future meeting and figure it out. But I think one of the things safely is doing what Kathy's talking about. We'll have to come up with a list of you know, tasks that we want the constable to do. The other side of it is we'll have to find somebody who wants the job. And you would go through that, the requirements, having consulted with law enforcement? I mean, how would you, is that a state statute or how would Mike's, you? Mike's done research on that. So the position is governed by state statute, that is correct. Um, there, is a, there is a pretty elaborate um, course of action to turn somebody into a law enforcement at, like, officer. And it's, well, at least from my personal perspective, that's not at all the direction that we're headed. Um, currently, the current constable does not have those powers, and I couldn't tell you if there has been an individual in town ever that has been a certified law enforcement officer. I would probably say that it's highly unlikely. Um, so they don't currently have any law enforcement uh, qualifications, and I don't think there's a direction to go that way. We, I do think that we're going to have to really think about long and hard exactly what we want the person to be doing and the direction that we want to do that. And now that we have the ability to um, identify those tasks, we can oversee and make sure that the person isn't going above and beyond doing things inappropriately. Kathy. Okay, so Kathy's comment was that there there is insurance currently that the town has to cover the constable's duties, and ha that has been the case. Okay, uh, Paul. Okay, can you hold on for the microphone, please. Um, so the, this insurance, but it, it wouldn't cover an incident if a constable stepped outside of his responsibilities. Now I can answer. I just know this is the recommended coverage by the DLCC. All right. No, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just asking. And then the other question I had is, well, I have two other questions. Is the current constable going to remain in place until you guys come up with a appointment after you, I don't know how that's going to work. We'll see what happens, but I don't think so. I don't think he's interested in going on, continuing on, but we'll let people know once, once we All right. communicate these articles and so forth and uh, talk to them. Okay. And then the, the last question is, it, it this seems like uh, um, almost a little overkill in some ways, because I, th I would think Vermont law specifies that no one who's not certified as a law enforcement officer can carry out law enforcement activities. Yeah, that's true. So we're just kind of saying to whoever takes this job, this is what the job is, and you, this is what you're legally, under Vermont law, allowed to do. Yes, okay. exactly. And I think, and again, Phil, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been some speculation over the last, at least the last meeting, that somehow we were trying to create 
a law enforcement position and where you know one one of the issues that I was confronted with from the time I got elected was speed control in town so it, at various points along the way the subject came up of because there's limited number of hours we get from the sheriff's department is there any way that we could have a local constable that would help with that when we looked into it we learned as Phil's saying and other people understand there's a lot of training and expense and so forth involved in getting to that point so I think we may have just or I may have just scared people into thinking that somehow we were trying to set up a Wyndham law enforcement branch when that might have been some kind of, you know, speculation or thoughts that were discussed at some point, but there was never any realistic, you know, conversation about it. But I think this is just going to clarify what the people want. Um, I will say this too, like Kathy said, I had a long conversation more than once with the uh, general counsel of Passive about the liability issue that Phil has brought up before, and we do have coverage for it, like you said, Paul. Um, he did say that we would be covered even if there was a firearm involved unless the, the person was knowingly stepping out of the bounds of what their responsibilities are. So for instance, if he knows full well that, that he doesn't have the law enforcement training or, or um, uh, authority to do a law enforcement activity, and he goes ahead and does it anyway and uses his firearm along the way, then there would be a problem with coverage. But if he's just doing his job on a normal basis and somehow something happened with you know, a firearm that wasn't in total violation with what he understands his responsibilities to be, they would, they would cover us. So it's not a, I don't, didn't come away from the conversation fearful that we were at risk of a lot of liability. Okay. Any other discussion on this article? Yes, Michael. Maureen. So uh, just a, a, a quick um, search on the Vermont State website. It, it lists the powers that the constable is given. Um, can I just read them very quickly? Go ahead. To serve civil or criminal process, destroy animals, kill injured deer, assist the health officer in the discharge of his or her duties, serve as a district court officer, remove disorderly people from town meeting, and collect taxes when no tax collector is elected. And we are the kind of state, I can't remember the name of it, but our town officials are only allowed to do what the state legislature gives us the power to do. So we can't deviate from that. And that's listed on the Vermont website. Okay, any other discussion? Did you have discussion, Russ? Okay, so seeing no other discussion, we're going to go into the voting portion of Article 20. Shall Wyndham prohibit the Constable of Wyndham from exercising any law enforcement authority? Reference 24 VSA Section 1936A. All those in favor say aye. And any opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 20 passes as written. Okay, now we've already voted on Articles 21 and 22. So uh, that brings us to Article 23, to transact any other non-binding business that may legally come before this meeting. That would be a good time if you had a straw, a straw poll or something like that anybody wanted to do or any announcements, anything that... Uh, um, I have an announcement, um, which is that Susan Persa asked me to uh, tell everybody that she and Paul Wyman are putting together a photo album of the town of Wyndham. So if you have any photos of Wyndham, historical or otherwise, that are unique to Wyndham, please contact Paul or Susan so they can put that in their photo album. Um, and that's in, there's an article about that in News and Notes. Um, any other non-binding business? Yes, Dave. Dave, Bill, Bill's, Bill's bringing a microphone over to you. Uh, 
on behalf of the Health Care Center and its patients, thank you for this year's town appropriation, which supports patient care. This is very short. Um, I want to let you know um, about a project that's in the works. Grace Cottage <clears throat> is in the process of applying for an Act 250 experimental permit to construct a new clinic building on their campus. It would replace the two old houses from the 1840s where Grace Cottage now provides more than 30,000 primary care visits a year. These buildings were never meant to be uh, used for that purpose and the community's need for the care has outgrown the space. The new building will be just north of the existing clinic, set back from Route 35 and attached to the existing hospital building. Grace Cottage hopes to break ground in 2025 for this project and already I've passed out several 50 flyers uh, for more information. So stay tuned. This is good news. Okay. Michael, something else? Um, go ahead, Maureen. Just to expand upon what you just said about Susan Persa and Paul Wyman's project, before we close up the building, if anybody wants to come down here in the library nook, um, Susan set up a card table, and there are two or three photo albums already on display. And she has um, some um, a story about what's going to happen. And she's also asking for volunteers to help. So if anybody wants to sign up to help her and Paul with this, they can do so. Okay, thank you. Um, Ellen? Um, I just wanted to announce that um, Ashley Pinger wanted me to let you know that there's one more rabies clinic at the town office. It's going to be on Thursday, uh, March 21st, and it's from 10 to 11, and they charge $22 for the rabies vaccination. And it's, um, she comes with a vet, and um, it's just a service they're providing to um, town, the towns that she serves. And um, also, please get your dogs registered by April 1st. <laughs> Thank you. Jan, did you have something? Mac. I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, good. Uh, we just went through a very divisive discussion about the school, and I think it was all made possible, you know, and helped a lot that we didn't have all of those signs all over town that we had in the past. And I just want to thank whoever made those decisions not to put up all those signs. I want to say thank you. Okay. Sorry, that, that was a comment uh, thanking uh, all parties for not putting up signs on the road um, it, before the, the election. Okay. Any other discussion, non binding articles? Kathy? I just thought it'd be nice to end on a high note, and that is that really in the past six months, we've been awarded almost $85,000 for different projects. And I think we should really feel good about where we stand and that hopefully, I don't know that the construction will be all done uh, on the meeting house a year from now, but um, knowing that we will be making extreme progress, I think should make everybody feel really good and it's a lot to celebrate and be happy about. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And Kathy is very instrumental in these grants, so thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Jan? Oh, say that again? Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Any, any other business to be brought before the meeting? Any other discussion? Paul? Yeah. Bill got his 10,000 steps in today. Yep. 
Okay. Um, well, I'm looking for a motion. If there's no other discussion, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Dion makes a motion to adjourn. Looking for a second. Second by Dan Riley. All those in favor of adjourning the town meeting until next year, say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Drive safely. Turn your clocks forward.